Why do we read books and watch movies? Part of the reason is to immerse ourselves in the heads of other people, experience many lives instead of just our own. But the other great reason is not about discovering others but about discovering ourselves. I sometimes wonder how much of my own self do I truly know? When I look back on how I viewed myself in my 20s, I realized that I did not know myself at all. I had a flat, distorted view of who I was. There were layers to me that I did not see, and what I did see was a misleading outline. And I'm sure that despite my best attempts at self-reflection, that is true even today. How do we get past this? Art is one way. When we read books and watch movies, then through the lives of others, we discover parts of ourselves that we did not know existed. I'm sure you also felt that shock of recognition when something in a book or a film touches you deeply, and it touches you deeply for a reason. The more we immerse ourselves in books and films, the better we know ourselves. Just as art can increase our empathy for others, it can increase our understanding of ourselves. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen. My guest today is Jay Arjun Singh, best known as a writer on film, but who also writes brilliantly about books and culture in general. I first met Jay in the heady blogging days of around 2004. I used to blog at India Uncut. His blog was called Jabberwock, and I immediately fell in love with his writing on films and books. The one quality that I liked about Jay's work is best expressed by Javed Akhtar's favorite word, Therav. I can't think of a precise English translation for it, though I'd describe it as a kind of stillness that allows for reflection. In Jay's case, often self-reflection through the prism of art. That quality was something that you could cultivate through the form of blogs. Newspapers and magazines did not give you that space of freedom and left a writer breathless because of the need to rush through what they wanted to say. Jay went on to write books on the film Janevi Do Yaro, the director Rishikesh Mukherjee, and he also edited an anthology of essays on films called Popcorn Essays. I still look forward to everything he writes, and I absolutely love this conversation. We spoke about the loneliness of growing up as a film lover in the 80s and 90s, how taste can both shape and be shaped by the circumstances of your life. What happens when art is viewed through ideological prisms, as often happens these days? And Jay also coaxed me to revisit Hindi films of the 1980s, which he says was not such a bad decade after all. Rahul Ravel, Zindabad, it seems. We actually didn't cover many of the subjects we wanted to chat about. Three hours is simply not enough. So we'll do future episodes as well. But for now, sit back and enjoy. And before that, let's take a quick commercial break. Sometimes when I enter a museum or an art gallery or just look at pictures of paintings by great artists, I don't quite know what to look for. I react to them viscerally, but I often wish I had a more nuanced understanding of the form. Do you also feel that way? If so, I have the perfect resource for you. Head on over to the sponsors of this episode, Wondrium at wondrium.com and check out this great course called How to Look at and Understand Great Art. I'll link it from the show notes. This consists of 36 episodes that are a masterclass in both art history and art appreciation. So if you're confused by what Impressionism and Expressionism have in common or where the art of the self-portrait evolved from or what exactly postmodernism is, this is the place to go. Now, Wondrium used to be known as the Great Courses Plus, who have sponsored many episodes of The Seen and the Unseen. I love browsing through Wondrium because it has all the great courses from the Great Courses Plus and videos and documentaries created in partnership with National Geographic, the Smithsonian and the Culinary Institute of America. It's such a great place to learn and you can get one month of unlimited free access if you use the following URL. Wondrium.com slash unseen. Let me spell that out for you. Wondrium. W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash unseen. U-N-S-E-E-N. I'll link it from the show notes. Sign up now for free and free your mind. Jay, welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. Thanks. Thanks for having me. We've been talking about doing this for a while. Glad we're finally doing it. 
Yeah, in fact, we last spoke about it when I was, in fact, in Delhi last year, I had come in February to do a bunch of episodes. I think I recorded some 10 episodes in um, uh, two weeks in an actual physical studio. And I remember you and I met in Saket and we had coffee at this delightful bookshop where I browsed around and discovered future guests. That's the place where I first saw Tripur Daman Singh's book, for example. And uh, and yeah, and then we uh, went to this restaurant and we uh, discussed that we have to do an episode sometime. And here we are and just look what the hell happened after that so <laughs> what, what have these last few months been like for you well it's been been tough like it has been for many people but of course not not as tough as it as it has been for the worst affected getting along being that you know in in keeping with with what we're going to be talking about i've actually done a few online uh, sessions and courses about cinema which is something that i that i probably wouldn't have thought to start if it hadn't been for the pandemic and and everything that it engendered got into the world of you know the uh, uh, online sessions and became comfortable with it and it's it's been uh, at least that part of it has been going fairly well other things not so much yeah it's it's going to be i mean i also started my writing course in april last year and it was just off a lark where i thought that you know would people be interested i put out a tweet asking if people were interested and people said yes and it's still going uh, strong i mean the 14th cohort is kind of going on now and it's also interesting i was thinking about every time we meet and we don't meet very often because hey bombay delhi though i i must tell you that i uh, meet my uh, bombay friends less than i meet you because you just take it for granted that they're in the same city right so you're not fixing up meetings and going and all of that but it struck me that we actually met very few times in the sense that we of course got to know of each other when we started blogging and i i'll, I'll discuss that period in detail with you also but uh, so that's that's when we kind of came to know each other and we found this very easy groove to our friendship as it were that every time we meet we're in the same kind of place and you know it's easy and it's comfortable and it's almost like a comfort zone thing and the reason I kind of bring this up is I've done episodes in um, the last few months with people I've known for about as long as you in the same way as you friends like Deepak Shinoy Sonia Falero who was in Bombay for a few years so I did spend much more time with her but it was interesting and I was just thinking about how friendships develop and form these kind of grooves. The easiest way to form a groove of friendship is of course when you're in school or college with someone and you're spending a lot of time together and you figure out each other's comfort zones and all of that. And the interesting thing is that that is shaped almost by happenstance because you know your physical location determines everything. You are in school or you are in college where you are, you can't choose anything. And also you change over time. So today I have virtually no friends, one or two maybe, whom I'm still in touch with from uh, sort of my pre-20 uh, life but I have plenty of people who are now my friends who I met in the mid aughties like you who you meet them because of a common interest or a common thing you do and then you just find a groove and that groove is almost uh, kind of always there and it's said that later in life you have trouble making new friends and and both of us are introverts right i do find it hard to kind of make new friends and find these grooves and all of that and and that kind of just got me to thinking about the nature of friendship and what it is and because at one level it just seems so mysterious you know sometimes i in my misanthropic way i can't figure out why anybody's friends with anybody <laughs> any thoughts on this Oh well, yeah, well, you know, I, I, you, you've already uh, said quite a bit about it, so it's, you know, couched as a question. 17 years, can you believe it? It's been 17 years since the, since the blogging thing happened. I, I, I actually remember the first time we met when you had come to the Delhi for something after we had been in touch with, you know, the, through, through the blogosphere. And I was listening to your to parts of your conversation with Annie Zedi uh, a while back and, and she was also part of of the the blog meets of 2004-2005 when we were, we, we were all being introduced to each other as you know, known turf and Jabberwock and and India and Cart and so on. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, what you were saying, you know, that it's it's interesting. I, I, I quite possibly though this is, don't want to get into competition territory now, but I quite possibly had even fewer friends than you did in in my school years. I uh, in addition to being introverted, I was also very painfully shy and. Uh, I know there was a lot of melancholia. Things things weren't great on the personal front. There were you know the, the things things going on, having to be away from school for for periods, and uh, it just struck me that one of the things that happened, you know, when uh, in the early 90s, when I really got into watching 
I, I got into doing the sorts of things that that the few friends I had were absolutely not interested in at the time. You know, obviously read, reading voraciously is one thing that I had that habit from from an early age, but. Uh, getting into watching old hollywood films then watching world cinema getting into all that as an adolescent and and i went through a period of around 6 7 years of crippling loneliness this is in the pre internet period where where i was convinced absolutely convinced that that i would you know go my whole life without ever having the sorts of friends who shared some of these interests the specific interests and and then of course the internet comes along and then within a few years or you know of course one thing led to another i i, I got a journalistic job with which put me in touch with people with with similar interests then suddenly a blogging and the world opens up and then you know the people like you are out there there are people outside india as well who you suddenly find yourself in touch with who share these interests and and and, and suddenly it's it's a very different landscape all around but yeah i mean uh, friendship I, I, i don't know i just feel like it's you know it's you you, you uh you know to one of the cliches that that we're constantly uttering and you know it's 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 completely true as cliches go is that all of us contain multitudes right and that mm-hmm. we are maybe we, we are different things at different points in our life uh in you know and and even at the same point you can be you know different in one context with one person and and in another context with another person i think uh, friendships just intersect in so many ways but uh, but that being said of course there are some people with whom you have you know a, a far more of a of a kindred thing going on uh, you know across across multiple interest areas and those perhaps tend to be the more lasting ones you know when you speak of that crippling loneliness i i kind of identify with, with with that in a sense and you know there is another kind of crippling loneliness that i think there is there in today's generation for different kinds of reasons but in our kind a uh, part of it of course was that being in india firstly you got exposed to so little of the outside world like unlike today everything wasn't at your fingertips like you said you know you've said elsewhere that once you got into foreign films you would go to embassies and you would take you know borrow video cassettes from there and it was just an effort to get anything of that kind and therefore by default like first you're in a poor country where you know culture hasn't flooded in we are not at that stage of technology where everything is on the internet secondly only the very privileged like you and me can for example see those kind of films you know you and me were probably watching the same kind of films at the same kind of time but we are in different cities so there is that physical barrier and then at a later point in time that physical barrier sort of uh, breaks down which i totally get so tell me a bit about your childhood years like what was it like what were you reading what were you watching how did you kind of uh, get drawn to films and so on there are no easy answers to those questions but uh, but you know anecdotally what i was reading and i you know and, and this of course is true of uh, you know the, uh, this disconnect between the sort of stuff that you are reading and the sort of stuff that you are watching this is something that uh, i th- i think mukul kesavan or someone else may have written about this written an essay about this uh, a certain type of urban anglophone indian who sort of grown up in a city whose first language more often than not is english or at least you know you're you're studying in an english medium school in my case my parents spoke with me mostly in english so so one is reading lady birds and enid blytons and things like that to start with and and maybe amachitra katha comics in in english and stuff also but one is almost exclusively watching hindi films that's the film culture that you're first exposed to so it's a bit strange really when when you think back on it that the world of the famous five is intersecting with the world of uh, of the amitabh bachchan masala film which was my preferred movie when i was uh, you know growing up 6 7 8 9 10 years old uh, it sounds like the worst cliche uh, on earth but but really bachchan was my superhero and the sorts of films i was most interested in for the for the longest time i think right up to the age of 12 13 14 were like i said the masala hindi film the dishum dishum films uh, the, the very macho uh, bachchan movies or you know if, if the film didn't have bachchan in it it had to be a multi starer with 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 three or four heroes you know the the nagen jani jo the dajani dushman rajput sort of movie and uh, it's pretty amusing because uh, you know the, a few years ago the, as you know i added a book on rishikesh mukherjee who was known for the for the slightly more subdued gentler middle cinema sort of sorts of movies and when i was working on that book many people just assumed that when i was growing up in the single channel era in the doordarshan era like everybody else of my generation i was besotted by the rishida movies like anand then chupke chupke and golmal bavarchi you know watching them over and over as as they appeared on tv and that wasn't the case i really wasn't at at that point in my life when i was when i was a child 
I wasn't interested in these boring movies. I, I only wanted the most action-packed, masalidar stuff. I, I didn't even want to see my favorite actors, Amitabh and Dharmendra, in these these Bhadralok personas in a film like Chupke Chupke. So, so there was, of course, a change in my tastes and and, and, and a lot of things coming together in subsequent years. But uh, initially, it was just that. Uh, one thing I'd like to just uh, just point out is, of course, many of us are movie buffs or movie nerds at a certain age. Uh, one of the differences, one of the things that distinguishes someone who goes on to become a professional film critic writing about cinema is perhaps that from a very early age, I think from when I was six, seven, eight years old, I just developed this habit of maintaining a register in which I would write, I would just scribble down the, the titles and the star casts of whatever films I saw, because of course, at that age, you're principally interested in the actors, right? That's what you're interested in. And, and because you've, you've looked at newspaper, uh, you know, reviews and star ratings, you've you know, been influenced by that sort of thing. So I had a register when I was maybe seven, eight years old, where, where, where I'd just be writing down things like, you know, the, the titles of all the films that I saw and giving them these massively exaggerated star ratings that would go right up to 16 stars, for instance. And, and, and what Out I was... Out of a five-star system. Uh, yeah, <laughs> instead of the five-star system, so you, so you'd go, go from the from the zero star to the 16-star system. And, you know, there'd be different sorts of adjective combinations that I would use uh, to describe what a particular rating meant. And I'd use up all the big words I knew. So a 10-star film might only be a magnificent classic, but a 16-star film like Sholay or whatever might be a stupendously fantabulous masterpiece or something like that. So, so, so I, I got into that habit and this of course is when I'm very small, seven, eight, nine years old. A few years after that, you know, when I was in my adolescence, I also became interested in rating films in a perhaps more disciplined and organized way. When I, when I got into old Hollywood films for the first time and I, and I bought an enormous movie guide called the Leonard Maltin a movie guide of 1990-91 and I lugged it around with me everywhere to video shops to to flip through you know to, to read the entries on individual films that were available at the store at that point again I I got into the habit of of maintaining a perhaps more organized register or diary of the films that I was watching but by that point I was also making little notes like one or two sentence scrolls about the film just something that struck me about the film something that I found interesting and I suppose that was really a, a prelude in many ways to to writing more analytically about films, which is something that would happen years later. So, you know, before we get back to the personal journey, a couple of questions that come to my mind from this. And one is that the moment you force yourself to give a rating for a film, I would imagine that it forces you to think a little deeper about the film because then you have to question, why am I giving it three stars? Why am I giving it four stars? What are the parameters? And equally, and a question that I'd really say for later, but it seems apt now, is that does actually formally writing about film, like at this stage, of course, you're doing notes, but later on you go on to actually write about cinema in a more formal way. Does that force you to think deeper about films? Because one experience of a film lover can be that you go to watch a film and you just sit down and you just watch it and you enjoy it for what it is you have thoughts about it but you don't write them down anywhere there's no structure you're, to, to your thinking you're not breaking shit down you're not thinking that uh, you know you're not necessarily making historical connections think, or going deep in all the many different ways that one can go deep whether we are talking about the craft or the form or the uh, you know where it stands in the director's uh, previous work and all of that so does uh, first giving these kind of ratings and two then actually writing about cinema does it for force you to th engage that much deeper in the sense that you have thoughts you wouldn't otherwise have had and because you have had thoughts that you wouldn't otherwise have had you are a changed person you know would you would you say that yeah no 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 of course it, it does work that way it still works that way you know in my in my 40s you know after the, for all these years of doing this uh, the one is constantly being surprised by something, uh, you know, and of course it happens, and I, and I know this happens with other writers as well, that uh, very often I'll, uh, you know, sit down to write about a film with, with, with only a, a very basic idea about, you know, of what I'm going to be writing and, and a basic sense of what I thought of the film, the, the, the two or three points that I'd like to make about it. And then in the process of, of writing about it, 
when you're sort of really getting into it deep at a paragraph by paragraph level, you find yourself articulating thoughts in the process of writing you know, and making these little connections that you mentioned in the process of doing that. It, it, it's not the case that, that everything is cleanly flow charted out beforehand. Sometimes that can happen also. I suspect that can happen when, when you're working on a very tight deadline and you're writing something, you know, for, for a limited word count, 600, 700 words. You know, you can, even while traveling by car or something, and you can be making basic structural notes on your cell phone and then typing the whole thing out on the, on the computer later. But that is a relatively low investment sort of review that I'm talking about. And I'm talking about the really, the fairly long form analytical essay. That's something, it, it happens routinely with me that, uh, that, uh, that I articulate my thoughts about the film and about perhaps my own response to the film and what that says about my mind or my you know personal experiences or whatever, my life experiences, my feelings about different things. I articulate a lot of those things to myself in the process of writing. Uh, now one, one thing I just like to touch on something that you uh, mentioned just now uh, about the sort of film nerd, the sort of film buff who engages deeply with the film but doesn't really feel, feel the need to write about it or to put one's thoughts down or, or, or to put, put his or her thoughts down uh, on paper or to, or to have it published somewhere. I have to say I very often have a deep envy for that sort of movie buff. Uh, I have many friends who are like that, friends who, who are quite possibly bigger movie nerds than I am, more capable of being articulate about a film in conversation than I would be but who have absolutely no impulse to write about it or to or to sit down and agonize over it in that sense and i think that's that's such a wonderful thing because you know i'm, I'm always surprising people when i tell them this i i don't watch anywhere near as many films as people as as people might think i do and one reason for that is that that every time i watch a film that stimulates me in some way it could be a positive way it could be a negative way i need to take a lot of time out to sit down and and write something about it, even if I, if, even if it's being written just for myself, even if it's some scattered, fragmented notes, which which I may or may not use months later in a column, even if it's not a piece that's being immediately written, I need to sit down and write about it then. And that actually eats into the time that I might have to watch another film very soon after this. So so it's it's very very rare for me today, for instance, that that I watch more than one film in a day. That almost never happens. And I have so many friends who, you know, will, will go to film festivals uh, in the pre-COVID world, you know, going to film festivals and watching four or five films over the course of a day. And that's something that, that I've never really done. You know, even at the age of 20, 21, and I was so enthusiastic about festivals or whatever it was, it's, I've never really had the mental energy to watch a number of films in a day. Because normally just watching one takes up so much of my mental space and my, and, 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 and I need to sit down and think about it, assimilate it, process what I've experienced. I don't know if I, uh, what is the other question you asked? I think I've just gone off on a tangent. It was essentially about this, about, you know, whether this imperative of having to write about a film, you know, improves your thinking about the film. And therefore, does that change you as a person? Like, but the, the drift I seem to be getting from your answer is that you are that kind of person anyway, who takes time to process things. So you would probably, uh, or, or is it a feedback loop where they kind of feed into each other? No, no, absolutely. Uh, uh, but, but also to perhaps more directly answer what you just asked. Uh, of course, it works that way. You know, there, I can think of numerous cases where a lot of films that I've written about over the years, not coincidentally, I think, have been films that touch on various aspects of the parent-child relationship. And uh, and I feel that there's a lot of writing that I need to do in the future as well. Perhaps not film-related writing, just, just general personal essay writing about my parents, uh, both of whom are, are now gone and, and, and I had very different relationships with, with, with each of them. I've often found that that I sit down to write about a film without thinking of it as, uh, without thinking that it's going to turn into a personal essay at all. And then in the process of writing about it, and of course I am writing about the film as well and about what's going on in the film, the, the quality of the acting or the directing or the music or whatever it is, all that is there as well. But in the process of writing about it, I realize that possibly one reason why this film meant so much to me or stimulated me to to thought or to, or, to, or, to, or to the action of writing is because there's something in it that ties in with my experience with my parents 
and then suddenly you know if if, if one is writing an an essay length piece or or writing the sort of a commission piece for someone where you have a certain amount of leeway to do personal writing as well i'll find myself writing four or five paragraphs of personal uh, reminiscence about uh, involving my mother or my father and tying that in with with how this particular film affected me so the, uh, so that happens a great deal as well and, and and of course then then the writing and the film analysis also becomes a conduit for perhaps understanding or articulating something about oneself about one's personal life Yeah, in one of your books, you you know mentioned that Pauline Kael was once asked about why she'd never written an autobiography, and she pointed to her anthologies of reviews and film essays and said, "I think I have," and that kind of brings me to my next question because it strikes me that people think that a review is or must be or should be in some way some kind of objective thing, right? And you've also spoken at length about how the earlier form of the review were newspapers in the nineties and two thousands would give like six hundred words, five hundred words, and what people came to expect would be just verdicts delivered on the movie. That acting is good, cinematography is good, so many stars. In fact, I used to have those Leonard Maltin guides as well. And it is only in retrospect, after many years, that I've realized that to me, that's kind of the wrong way to think about films, as if there there is a hierarchy of merit, so to say, when different films. films can appeal to people for so many uh, different reasons now whether i'm reading about books or cinema or even when i write about those what i have realized is that when i'm reading something what i value is always something that is in the realm of the subjective in fact what i value is always something that is coming from the author's personal life and experience and whatever because that is the only thing that can make anything worth reading anybody can say star cast was good and cinematography was this and it's so many minutes long and this is a plot and spent 300 words giving the plot anybody can do that what makes an essay on a film or a review or whatever stand out will necessarily in a sense be autobiography not autobiography in the sense that there is a book about parents and you relate to that because you're thinking of your parents not in that kind of direct yeah. sense but there is some emotional resonance like in another piece of yours you mentioned this beautiful phrase by sunita rapurwala where she talks about the spiritual dna of a film you know which i would say could be the essence of a film i think this was you were part of a panel on the translation of yeah. books into films and you were kind of talking about transferring this essence from one to the other so and and this is something that i feel is true that everything i write about anything and this is of course not true perhaps of my political op-eds or whatever but more and more whatever i do including this podcast which is kind of my journey and the stuff i'm thinking about and the stuff i'm interested in more and more the things i find value in and the things i want to do are those things that are imbued with the personal what's your thinking about this and initially when you start thinking along these lines is there something holding you back is there like a sense of guilt that there should be no i in this that there is something objective about everything and you have to get that across and because especially as a news reporter that is of course true that you're just reporting facts and trying to get to the truth but that's kind of what it is but you know um, so is that something that you begin thinking about that you begin resisting that should i put so much of myself into this and at what stage do you begin to realize that this is a dope this is what i want to do and and so on now almost needless to say i i, I agree with pretty much everything you said there about the importance of uh, subjectivity and the inter- interestingness of subjectivity uh, uh, to answer the, the last thing you asked just now uh, I, I, i can say with some pride that i have never felt guilty about about the about the possibility of putting an i into my writing what i have felt early in my career you know when when i was 20 21 22 years old you know as a journalist obviously subject to a much greater degree to the to the hegemony of one's bosses and and, and the things that they expected you to do at that point of course you, know, you did run into the sort of senior editor who would who would frown on the use of an i in a review and 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 that's something you still have even today in 2021 you know in in some mainstream publications you know whatever including a couple that i write for right now uh, where you you will get told by the person who's commissioned the piece listen so and so this this guy at the top he's a he's a bit conservative in his thinking you know it's usko first person acha nahi lagta so you know so you 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 make those little adjustments if you if you feel that that is still worth your time and you know the money is worth it or whatever it is and here i'm talking about the 
a very short form sort of review that that does not involve a lot of personal investment for me so i'm okay with with doing an objective seeming review structurally objective seeming though it is of course still completely subjective and, and i'm okay with doing that for a certain sort of publication but generally speaking uh, throughout my writing life my professional writing life including those earliest years uh, the sort of writing i was most interested in was the navel gazing you know and i'm and i'm saying that in a deliberately self deprecating sort of way there was a sort of writing that gets described as navel gazing by a, by a lot of people i just took it as a given that anything i write with seriousness of purpose and with integrity is going to be as much about me and the way my mind works as it's going to be about the thing that's being written about i just took that as a given and uh, and i didn't even see that as an arrogant position i uh, so somewhat similar to what you said that you know to me it was self evident as a reader as well that that i would be most interested in review or the sort of work of criticism or the sort of essay that provided a glimpse into how a particular sort of mind received a particular sort of film or book or whatever it was that's the sort of film writing that i had been very interested in when when i first seriously got into film literature Uh, in my adolescence around the time that i started watching old hollywood films i also started seeking out a lot of film literature by people like well pauline kyle is of course one of the, the one of the obvious suspects but but also a few other writers uh, who who had done books on hitchcock on howard hawks and and a few others and i always found that writing that sort of personal writing very interesting very stimulating Uh, now, uh, now when i did that rishikesh mukherjee book that i mentioned i was clear from the start that the, that the book would be as you know however arrogant the sounds to some people that the book would be as much about my mind as it would be about rishikesh mukherjee's films and and i really did not mean that in an arrogant way at all and i mean i mean that as a compliment to rishikesh mukherjee's films for stimulating my mind in a certain way but of course what happens then is that that when you've written a book like that and the book has you know the publisher has marketed it you know to make it seem like it might be a little more biographical than it is a little more anecdote driven than it is and then of course people start reading the book people pick it up on amazon and instead they they start writing online reviews of the book i actually have a number of one star reviews of that book on amazon which say things like this book is not about rishi rishi dar is about this book is about jay arjun singh <laughs> and uh, and an an objective book about rishikesh mukherjee's films would have recognized the brilliance of anand but this book hardly uh, says anything about anand you know so the, the, so so that sort of thing and and I, and i took that sort of thing as a, as a big compliment in a way even though of course it hurts to have one star reviews on uh, on online forums because really to to my mind and to again coming back to what you touched on earlier at a time when when the internet is full of hundreds maybe thousands of blog posts about a high profile film like anand or golmal a lot of which are basically just saying the same thing over and over again providing a plot synopsis and saying something very you know very trite in my view like anand is a film is an inspirational film about a man who teaches everybody that that death can be conquered you know something really obvious like that and once it's been said a thousand times all over the internet i feel like if i am doing a book about rishikesh mukherjee's films i want to say something about the anand that i experienced and and maybe bring something new to the table that has not been said before uh, and if if i can do that honestly i mean it shouldn't be a contrived thing of course it should it should, it should come honestly from from my engagement with the film then that's what i want to do i don't want to just write something that you, you can easily find on wikipedia anyway so 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 yeah so agree with pretty much everything you said there yeah and also it strikes me that number one that whole expectation that there can even be an objective book about rishi das films for example is completely untrue there is no like universal truth to them that is there to capture everybody views it differently even rishi da will would have viewed it differently and not gotten that and i think that and i agree with you that though i can tell it hurts i can tell the one star reviews hurts oh your if i can just if i can just in, in, interrupt uh, uh, for a second uh, what you said there is absolutely true because you know if you, if you were to read rishikesh mukherjee's interviews over a period of 30 40 years he is contradicting himself all the time 
even about his own films you know then and, and, you know you, you know one of the things i found fascinating was the sense of a very conflicted man working in a mainstream film industry where a certain degree of compromise was required you knew what you you, uh, you know how it, how mainstream hindi films tended to be made in the 60s 70s without without bound scripts uh, often you know with with producers dictating things the star system dictating things in the midst of all that if you have a a director with a certain sensibility of his own having to make compromises every now and again or, or do things on the fly uh, of course there's going to be a lot of self berate beratement happening at the same time there's going to be defensiveness once in a while if he gets criticized by someone else he'll stand up for himself so if you read his interviews in one interview he'll say one thing about golmal in another interview he'll say something that sounds very different about it so so you know so so the subjectivity as you suggested just now comes in even with the creative person Yeah and and it's appropriate that you know one should have conflicting views on a film with a title like Golmal and and it strikes me that that's not necessarily just true of him it's true i think of every creator in the sense that you are driven to do certain things you may not yourself know where those impulses come from and why you're driven to do them you tell a story to yourself about them that story can change as your self image changes or as your desire to project a certain image of yourself to the outside world changes so it's a sort of constant mishmash of changing narratives inside your own head and i would still say that you know then a naysayer would say that okay if uh, jay arjun is uh, talking about rishida's films from his point of view or if amit is pursuing his intellectual journey in his podcast why should the rest of us be interested right it's just personal you enjoy it let your friends listen but i think that's just a wrong way around because i think what then someone like you is doing is if you're exploring a certain avenue and you know what those films meant to you i think a lot of people are trying to figure stuff out like when i try to figure stuff out through the show a lot of people are on similar journeys where they're trying to figure stuff out and your journey is relevant to everybody for that reason as long as you do it honestly and you do it in a authentic way and you're you're not just being performative i think it's of tremendous value uh, for that reason by the way i got to tell you that i am uh, one of these uh, people you just derogatory said they watch four or five films a day during film festivals uh, you know and uh, for the last few years while mummy was on that was pretty much my routine during mummy we read what some 28 29 films in the week that it was uh, on and i would also kind of live tweet about it almost like not during the film but after every film i'd you know have a little bit and i found that it helped because putting a tweet about something compressing it in so many characters would just force me to think a little deeper about why i liked it and why i didn't like it i i think that kind of sharpens your thinking like going back to what you said earlier like in my writing course i often quote john didion who once said that i don't know what i think until i write it down so the process of writing is not just a way of oh i'm thinking something i got to put that on paper the process of writing can shape your thinking and in that sense kind of shape the person you are let's let's go back to biography now uh, as you can see i'm treating you the way you treated rishida so <laughs> <laughs> let's let's yeah just uh, just wanted to i wanted to quickly add to that that john didion quote uh, the roger ebert had had something along those lines to i don't remember the exact thing but it was something like like uh, you know advice to writers that the muse doesn't come you know before you start writing the more the muse comes while you're writing when you sit down yeah, to write yeah. that's when the yeah which is why discipline and process is so important like one of my four webinars in my writing course is just about process which people kind of ignore people think if you understand the craft you have an intellectual understanding of what a good sentence is you are covered no you're not covered you still have to get your ass down and actually write the damn thing now you know one thing i was kind of struck by and i haven't thought about it in these terms before though you know the thing about people containing multitudes is actually a cliche on my show so it's a cliche i'm kind of guilty of it's so true but the context in which i never thought of it is how you mentioned that people like us people like you and me the english speaking elite so to say in 1980s india would be reading one kind of thing but watching entirely another kind of thing though there also i was a child of privilege because my dad was a director of the ftii from the mid 80s so i got to watch a lot of world cinema as a matter of course but in general there is this classic disconnect where it's almost like we are one person when we read an english book we are another person when we watch a hindi film and uh, my question to you is about when does that sort of shift happen where initially you are reading everything and you're um, watching everything and it's entertainment and you're just enjoying it and all of that but at some sense there is a shift where you know some switch goes off and you're like 
you know, you get it. You get art, you get literature, whatever. I mean, I mean, I, I know that sounds kind of uh, pompous, sir, but you get it. You get that there's something else, is something deeper. Like in my case, like I sometimes say it happened when I happened to pick up Dostoevsky's House of the Dead when I was uh, 10. And I thought it'll be a thriller, be zombie horror, whatever. And suddenly, you know, my mind is blown and then it's my gateway into that kind of thing. Similarly, in your essay about horror films in uh, the great book you edited, Popcorn Essays, you wrote about how for you that might have been psycho, where you're watching a whole bunch of horror films before that and you're, you know, getting into the genre and really loving it. But it's psycho, which is something else. And you're not scared while watching it, but other parts of you kind of get activated. Is that shift something that you've thought about? Is it a gradual thing or is it a one day thing? Is there an, a sort of a exhilaration and a hunger that goes with it that you know you discover this whole new world tell me a bit about that and tell me a bit about this transition then from someone who is loving films to someone who begins to appreciate it in deeper ways you know this is a very difficult question uh, uh, i'm well, I, I can tell you it definitely wasn't a, sh a sudden shift if, if it was a shift it was a very gradual one and it's still going on in my 40s I feel like, you know, if I were to spend the next 50 years, uh, you know, writing and thinking about films at the end of my life, I would still feel like I was, you know, just a, just a, just a student in, in, in the first grade or something uh, and, and, and hadn't engaged with a fraction of everything I could engage with. Uh, the, the psycho thing, you know, just, just to provide context for, uh, for those who don't know, uh, I'm actually in the process of writing a lot of uh, these uh, little personal essays that I'm currently doing just for myself or putting versions of them up on the blog or on Facebook because this year marks 30 years of, you know, the, from the summer of 1991, which is a, a very major period in my film, film watching life and probably the period that's closest to the sort of shift that you're talking about, even though I'm personally reluctant to, to, to speak in the language of, of shifts as if it's some sort of, you know, life altering thing. Uh, because because I continue to maintain that, that 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 my arc as a film watcher has been a very weird one. You know, it's it's not like it's, it's not something as simple as okay, I was I was watching only masala Hindi films up to uh, the late eighties or the early nineties, and and then uh, there's there's a sudden turn into watching old Hollywood, and from there getting into world cinema. A lot of this is also facilitated by the fact that that satellite TV came to us in in the early nineties. You know, in the, in the mid nineties, star movies had this thing called Hundred Years of Cinema, where they, where, they, where they showed all sorts of things for months on end. There were there were the embassy video libraries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so I had access to a lot of stuff. Things changed for me for around 10, 12 years. I was completely out of the world of Hindi cinema. I think I had just been so sated by that particular sort of filmic language, that 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 over the top, hyper dramatic language and because as a personality type I was very reserved very emotionally undemonstrative it perhaps also in some small ways became a, a rebellion against hyper drama against larger than life things and for, for several years I, I got into what you know I developed a taste that was almost exclusively for the more restrained forms you know whether it was old Hollywood which was a little more subdued than mainstream Hindi cinema or world cinema by people like Bergman or, or whoever. But having said all that, then in my 20s, I then returned to the fold of Hindi cinema and found myself appreciating a lot of these larger than life, hyper dramatic films, you know, through new lenses and, and finding a lot of uh, emotional resonance in them all over again. And, and today, you know, if there's something that I, that I value in myself as a film watcher or as a film writer, it would just be this, that, you know, without any conscious effort on my part or some, you know, some deliberate attempt to be a viewer who watches many different sorts of things, I just developed a sort of egalitarianism as a film watcher, an open-mindedness to all sorts of forms, all sorts of genres, you know, from the, from the really restrained, you know, the mode of kitchen sink realism to the larger than life, you know, the language of filmmakers like like one of your favorites, Sanjalila Bansali. Uh, and, 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 I, I got to point and, out to listen, viewers right here that uh, Jay is being ironic because uh, Bansali is exactly the kind of uh, film cinema I don't like. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, for anybody who's who's uh, heard your previous post podcast already knows knows that I suspect. But uh, uh, but yeah, so 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 I'm all this is really to say that that I'm resistant in many ways to to suggesting that there is a clear cut evolution as a film watcher 
because also what happens uh, amita feel is that uh, and this two of you know whether whether one is talking of cinema or literature maybe it's just the circles that i move in you know the the, the sorts of people that i interact with uh, most these days but, but but i feel like many people just view that evolution in terms of you know moving from from the the escapist things you loved as a child to the more somber things that that are that are befitting for you as an adult viewer when you start you know you 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 become more interested in things like realism or or whatever or an understatement or or authentic pictures of the world around you and i don't really feel like i've had that journey i think my journey has been much more back and forth like that i today i can you know depending on the sort of mood i'm in when i when i wake up in the morning or the sort of sort of mood i'm in during in the middle of the day i i can just as easily watch a gritty understated completely realistic film as i can watch uh, an over the top loud slapsticky or melodramatic film and 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 enjoy it and find some level of stimulation from that but uh, to also come back to the the question of shifts uh, what happened with psycho really was that it, it it became a turning point for me because i watched it uh, i found it a bit creepy of course in some ways but again i just found this tremendous sadness in it as a film and i uh, related to it in ways that i perhaps would not have been able to articulate back then as a 13 or 14 year old but which i found myself making sense of subsequently you know the, as a young boy who was living with a single mother with a with a recently divorced mother having you know escaped a, a house that had had unpleasantness and violence in it and and now dealing with the, with the new challenges that came with with uh, with living as you know as part of this somewhat unconventional family unit with the, with my mother and and her mother my nani who uh, did so much for us but was also an extremely boisterous and extroverted person the the sort of person that that I was wary of as a child as, as a very shy introverted child so there are all these conflicts going on for an adolescent for a for a 13 14 year old and i found that at watching psycho with with its reflections especially in this this beautiful scene in the middle of the film where the, where the norman bates character and and then the marion crane character played by janet lee they sit and just talk in the parlor and for those 10 minutes or so the film is like it's it's like a bergman film or a or a, or a chamber drama or something and they and they are talking about loneliness about things like that and what it means to love someone and to hate that person at the same time or to feel like you're in your own private trap versus being free and i just found a lot of resonance in that a lot of sadness in that and that that was one of the things that led me perhaps to you know it it, it came at a time in my viewing life when like i already mentioned uh, i was starting to get a little tired of of the overwrought language of the hindi films that i was watching this so this is also a time when when uh, bachchan is in de- is in decline serious decline you know there, there have been some truly ghastly films like uh, tufan and jadugar in the late 80s and uh, so, so so it just turned into a it just happened to be a good time for someone like me to start exploring new pastures and to and to get into new idioms of filmmaking and one thing just led to another and and, and i became a new type of movie nerd uh like i said i was i was away from the world of hindi cinema for around 12 years almost that said there there's one little caveat which 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 might confuse this whole narrative all over again uh, in the middle of that 12 year period i, I was taken uh, by friends by, by by the few you know friends slash close acquaintances i had at that time in the college years to watch uh, dilwale dulhaniya le jayenge in, in 1995 when it when, when it just came out on the big screen and i really enjoyed it i i enjoyed it thoroughly i'm not sure if i admitted it to myself or i admitted it to my friends but but i felt stimulated by it and i was i was i was completely you know immersed when when the song sequences came on when when sharuk does that 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 crazy thing on the piano early in the film and i found that fantastic it reminded me of some of the some of the shami kapoor films i had seen so i still even at that point in my viewing life i obviously had the dna that enabled me to immerse into language or mainstream hindi cinema it's just that it wasn't important enough to me so so after that one ddlj experience i didn't go back to watching hindi films on the big screen or anything like that i, I went back to the sort of cinema that i had been you know that i had become recently interested in it took a while to get back to hindi cinema but yeah that's that's uh, 
roughly what the journey was like at that point. It also it also brought a lot of a lot of loneliness with it because because the sorts of films I was watching, I I really did not have any friends or anyone I could talk about them with. All of this is fascinating, and, and especially you know when you when you mentioned uh, uh, Bachchan's bad films, Jadugar, and all the other rubbish that came around that time. You know, the thought that comes to my mind is that today, when people look back on the career arc of a person like him, you know, they can just focus on his good films, and uh, you know, almost a selection bias there, and and they know that there are bad films in that arc, but it's a historical thing. But there are people who kind of live through these periods where I think the eighties was, uh, uh, you know, not just a bad time for say. Uh, Bollywood. It was also a, a kind of horrendous time for uh, Western rock, for example. You had all those hair bands and all of that. It almost seems like to, to grow up in that time. I think uh, you, uh, you and I should get uh, special points for surviving all the bad art that came out during that time. I have to say, I, I somewhat disagree with that. I mean, when you say eighties is a bad time for Western rock, or wasn't that the time when when you had REM and U two both sort of doing some of their some of their major early work and. Uh, Well, 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 a few other. I'm kind of thinking more about all the hair bands and the big arena bands and all of that. And REM really got into their best phase, I would say, in the late '80s, early '90s. Uh, from that period on, my favorite REM work is certainly '90s. And YouTube, of course, Joshua Tree was '80s, but Aktung Baby was early '90s, if I remember. So also, I have to say, at, at risk of again uh, confusing the narrative or sort of getting our boxing gloves on, I've, I've actually one of the, one of the many things. I've changed my mind about a bit, and 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 I do this uh, infuriatingly often, often to the degree that that I go back and look at my blog post written twelve, thirteen years ago, and I find myself disagreeing with everything I've written in a particular post. Uh, but uh, I, I'm not that sure anymore that that the 1980s was was such a bad time for Hindi cinema. And I'm and I'm not. Let me clarify right at the outset. I'm not talking about the 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 art movement or the parallel movement. I'm talking about about a lot of other stuff that was happening, which was included. And you now no one's going to suggest that that these films are are interesting from beginning to end, or or really really you know organically well created or anything like that. But but I still feel like there was some interesting stuff going on in the mainstream done by directors like like J P Datta and Mukul Anand and Rahul Ravel. And and a couple of others, and it's not as bad a time as a lot of us uh, think it was. Also, I think with hindsight, I feel like a case can be made that there was a lot of a lot more honesty in some of the best of those films, or some of the some of the eighties films than there has been in the last two decades, where a lot of filmmakers, including the really good filmmakers who who deserve to be respected, seem to just be very aware of their place in a global world. and constantly having conversations with other international cinemas to the degree that they are you know that that they are almost operating in that idiom in the idiom of what a what a certain sort of homogeneous good film what most cineasts would describe as a as a good film internationally speaking should look like a lot of the indie hindi films of the last uh, 10 15 years i feel have you know have formally modeled themselves on that structure uh fun with very good results i'm talking about films that i've enjoyed a great deal but i do wonder at times if if something has also been lost along the way in terms of you know moving away from the very special language of hindi cinema as it once used to be when when it was tonally all over the place when you know, when its masala derivative sort of came from Uh, as we say as we as we know from the from the parsi and sanskrit theaters and you, know, you had a lot of tones mishmash together in the same film i sometimes feel that it's a bit of a loss that we moved away from there as well or at least that there, there seems to be no place at all for that sort of filmmaking in today's world unless it's done ironically unless it's meant to be a nudge nudge wink wink thing or something i i, I do feel that's a loss yeah. So before we get back to your personal journey narrative, I'll I'll kind of double click on this digression and kind of ask about this itself. That you know I I get what you're saying. You're saying that at that time filmmakers are they are what they are, and there's no pretentiousness there. They don't have like today people have you know different kinds of expectations of themselves and all of that and whatever. And we we'll come to current day um, uh, cinema a little later. But just going back to the eighties, my my conception would be that. it wasn't that there was like almost a deliberate ideological decision that world cinema be damned this is what we do we'll continue doing it and that therefore there is a certain kind of purity in that i don't think there was something like that i think it was a lot of the films that were being made were being made not out of 
that sort of conviction but just out of you know they were they were just doing what they knew they were just being reactive to what they thought the audiences wanted at this time i mean i understand that there are interesting things happening during this time that we do you know chopra met parinda but again he is influenced by a lot of world cinema already so leaving those kind of outliers aside the rahul ravels and the jp dattas and decoyt and all of that stuff uh, which is kind of happening but does seem to me filmmakers just focusing in a mode of giving the audiences what they want getting a box office hit so to say and nothing and i'm not dissing that you live within your culture and it's perfectly fine if you want to just do that and do nothing else but any thoughts on that and specifically then what are the films that you'd look at during that period and say that these are films that we should revisit now it's not as bad as we used to think it was like i think mr india was 80s and i'm sure you'd uh, you know consider that as part of uh, but uh, apart from that what are the kind of films which you think we should revisit and why See there are there are there lots of films. I mean, now the thing is that uh, I'll, I'll name a few, but then again, it, it it comes with the necessary caveat that that many people, maybe you, uh, maybe many others listening to this, will not even agree with me that these are films worth uh, revisiting. So, that, so we have to you know again come back to the to the subjectivity of all this. And uh, one more thing that I, that I like to say, which 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 perhaps has a bearing on 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 some of what I'm talking about, is that that as I've grown older as a film buff, one of the things that has happened to me is that I've become far more interested not in films that are interesting or well done from beginning to end or you know just just sort of you know you look at the the, the totality of the beast and say okay this is a four star film or a five star film to, to to use the reductive language of star ratings but films that that might even be pretty average in some ways maybe tacky in some other ways maybe uh, whatever whatever word you want to use uh, regressive is a word that gets used a lot when we when we talk about any sort of old cinema but also has points of interest also has some sequences some things that it does very well now now now, now increasingly i found myself finding a lot more time for that sort of thing compared to you know this this assessment driven idea of what sort of film is it on the whole and of course i'm also speaking with the privilege of being somebody who who doesn't do reviews on a very regular basis i you know I, I, in, the, in the last few years i've been writing columns i've been i've been allowed to write these very whimsical personal pieces where uh, so, so for instance two different columns that i've done for two different publications have actually been about sequences about moments in, in a film and and of course how how those moments tie in with the with the larger animal So, so, so I've had the luxury of doing that, which, which, which is perhaps not a luxury that that the the regular Friday to Friday film reviewer has. But that is how it's worked for me. One one of the books that I hope to work on in the future, I don't know if I ever will, is will be an anthology of moments, an anthology of important moments uh, from Hindi cinema, which which could be and and a moment can be defined as a full length ten minute sequence, or it could be an actor's gesture, just a little gesture, uh, the movement of the head, which. seems to speak volumes or whatever it is and of course it will be very subjective so i'm i'm saying all this also partly to to uh, prepare you and, and your listeners for uh, for the possibility that that some of the films that i mentioned will may not really be seen by most film buffs as good films capital g capital b Look, you know may, may just may just interrupt and say that you don't have to be so defensive and when i, I asked you the question defensive. i am uh, always no, when defensive I, when i asked you the question i did it with the actual sincere intent of actually revisiting some of this stuff you're talking about to educate myself uh, so but anyway continue well well, well 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 because this this is meant to be about 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 my subjectivity as a, as a person uh, i have to say i, I am defensive 99% of the time when i'm when i'm talking about my tastes well, no so okay so this to, to come back to what i'm saying you know just just look at directors the interesting works of some directors and i i think some of subhash khai's films Uh, including Mary Jung, which has which has Anil Kapoor and Manakshi Shadri in it, is 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 one of the relatively interesting uh, mainstream films of that period. In general, I think you mentioned Mr. India, of course, which which I think Mr. India is a is actually a fairly respectable film in in many ways. I think and I think I think there are a lot of people who who can just see the craft of that film and the honesty of that film as well quite easily. But I think this might be a good time to talk about how many of us have undervalued Anil Kapoor. as an actor and, and and he did so much interesting stuff in the 1980s of course it's it's amazing that that he's he still managed to be relevant in various ways uh, you know in his 60s but uh, but back then i remember you know when when I, when i was a kid in the 1980s even though i was surrounded by the world of mr india and tezab and parinda 
and uh, this film called Ishwar, in which Anil Kapoor was quite had, had a very interesting role, and uh, Avargi, you know, a few other films like that. Somehow, uh, I, this is something that I that I articulated to myself only years later. Somehow, I thought of all these films in terms of other people in the films: Shri Devi, Madhuri Dixit, Jackie Shroff in Parinda, Nanna Patekar, and uh, uh, things like that. Karma, Subhash Khai's Karma, in which it became became so easy to sort of just see. Anil Kapoor playing this buffoonish character jumping around all over the place you know and you and instead you're, you're supposed to be looking at Dilip Kumar and uh, Nutan and and all that uh, uh, it's only later many years later that I realized that Anil Kapoor was was a pretty major part of these films and he was you know at the very least quite good in most of them and you know he he held his own he did everything that was required of him and uh, and i think uh, so certainly his early career including his his mainstream career at, at that time and of course the the slightly not so mainstream career which which includes lower profile films like chameli ki shaadi and saheb films like that perhaps uh, deserves to be looked at again uh, there are of course films which which primarily have what one might think think of as kishi value or cheesy value but which can also be quite stimulating in its own way if you are in a certain type of mood so you know so so i uh, i remember that uh, you know films like the film in which jackie shroff co starred with a dog teri mehrbaniya which was you know it, it's a, it, it's a film that <laughs> yeah. actually, even back then at the age of 7 or 8 when when one was uh, watching the songs on chitrahar i think even at that point one realized that that one was watching something that's a bit silly or, or whatever word you want to use but again you know I, i watched a lot of that film no not the whole thing again but but i think maybe 80% of the film on tv when it when, when when it happened to be coming around maybe 10 years ago or something and i just found myself absorbed in it and just watching it and and maybe it had something to do with the fact that that my own life had had become quite dog centric by that point also so you know so so one is interested in certain things in 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 what the relationship might be like at its core if you look at it you know if you if you take away the the really melodramatic trappings and just just look at the emotional core of it that there might be something to it i found that interesting as well that there are jp datta's films definitely deserve to be revisited unfortunately to the best of my knowledge there are you know major films like gulami for instance do not seem to be available in their complete prints anymore i think it's it was a more than 3 hour long film and and i think it's it's on youtube or something in 2 hours 20 minutes or something funny like that I I don't know how these things even work at times. And Hathiar, which was a, which was another JP Datta film, which 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 I was a big fan of, and you know when it first came out, and and when I watched it many years later, you know, these are all films that that broadly use the language of the mainstream Hindi film of the nineteen eighties, you know, overwrought, sometimes you know embarrassingly dramatic. loud music used to used to underline everything i know and i know you have a major problem with with that use of that, that emotional cue providing use of music uh, i don't as a rule i actually actually find find it very stimulating in in many contexts but i would admit that that a lot of the 80s films perhaps went over the over the top with it or or you know it's it's a bit difficult to watch some of some scenes in those films because of how we've now been conditioned by by the slightly more realistic cinema this is also true of course of of old hollywood uh, the, a lot of the 30s uh, last year when i was uh, hosting these fa- these film discussion sessions and looking at uh, genres like film noir and and the screwball comedy and john and other and i'm looking at 1940s hollywood films i found myself cringing just a little bit when even in a really really good billy wilder film that i loved you know that that be you know the music would be a little more insistent than felt strictly necessary but on the whole i don't really have a problem with with that i'm i'm, I'm uh, you know i i find it quite stimulating at times but yeah so jp datta a few of mukul anand's films are quite interesting uh, rahul ravel you mentioned uh, then a film like arjun for instance which is which is which is an interesting mid 80s take on on the angry young man uh, for the unemployment era that sort of thing there are quite a few others uh, i'll keep bringing them up over the course of these conversations yeah yeah no no you mentioned my uh, sort of distaste for uh, spoon feeding in the sense background music that tells you how to feel and all of that and i've actually been thinking about that in recent times and what i've realized is that at one level obviously i prefer a certain kind of understatement where i am being manipulated as little as possible and 
you know what's happening is happening but then the point is that manipulation is inevitable because every choice that a director makes within a film has a certain effect on the even uh, even, even in a documentary so every second of a film even in a documentary so even when ozu keeps a still camera in tokyo story and people are doing what they're doing he has still chosen to keep it still he's chosen to keep it in a particular place he's chosen to keep it for that bit of dialogue and not some other all these are choices are affecting you so you're being manipulated anyway people may manipulate you in understated ways or they may manipulate you in uh, you know more flamboyant and obvious ways but what is happening is what is happening so even if you look at say the you know last bond trier's dogmi kind of school that we won't have background music and we won't have this and we won't have that but the bottom line is even those are choices there's no way to kind of get away from the artifice of you know uh, the act of creation whether you're telling a story through a book or a film or whatever But you know, you know, you know the, that's uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, that's that's a that's a very good point. That there's also another thing to be said, which may, maybe we can touch on a bit later about the personality divide. You know, and you know what what, what you said just now uh, uh, actually chimes with with something that that I've had to think about a lot in recent years. You know, as I mentioned, one possible reason why why I needed to get away from from the language of of the typical mainstream Hindi film as an adolescent was because it was it just sort of it was. it seemed too connected and then there's something i wrote about in an essay uh, uh, a couple of years back also and i ended up articulating it in the process of writing it it felt too close to certain other things that i was feeling stifled by as, as a very introverted very undemonstrative kid you know the the, the boisterousness of my nani my grandmother who was a woman who loved me a great deal but also was too loud and extroverted for my liking and then and, and, and you know and then moving away in some ways from her world and you know when it became possible for me to you know to have a video cassette player in my room and to keep my door shut and to sit down and watch hitchcock and john ford instead of watching uh, the later salman khan film of of 1991 so uh, so all that is there but 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 i've also had to think about this a great deal there are, there, there are coming back to the multitudes that all of us contain one thing that that i've always been a little puzzled about in you know in my own personality when it when it comes to how i uh, watch films or how i respond to films is how very often there's you know I, i'll find myself identifying with a character or really feeling uh, feeling drawn to a character who on the face of it is completely different from me you know there there's there's no uh, you know connect at all and, and and the earliest example i can think of actually goes back all the way back to my childhood you know you're, you're watching shole for the first time i think it was probably you know when i was 5 or 6 or 7 years old and and, and amita bachchan was everything to me right and uh, and in this film amita bachchan is playing a character who has my name and is and is playing this this very taciturn slightly sarcastic character and, and, and that was pretty close to my self perception as well and you you just think that, that that is the character i'd be most interested in in the film and, and i can say this hand on heart i can say this from from the earliest that i can remember watching shole and 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 it, and it continues to this day i've always found dharmendra's viru far more interesting far more stimulating you know when the two of them are on screen together i'm always looking at dharmendra and to to, to see what he's doing you know to to see his you know his his exaggerated gestures and his grimaces and and the things he does with those huge hands of his and and that's something that it took me a very long time to even make sense of this because it's completely counterintuitive it makes no sense at all if you, if you think of of art or creative works as as being things that that help you you know tap into aspects of yourself then i think a case can be made that that maybe there's closet extrovert in me some some hidden boisterous viru who who got that sort of catharsis from watching dharmendra in that film and uh, and there are many other examples of that sort i can think of i mean the example that comes to mind is all the colorful t-shirts uh, and sweaters that you wear so maybe those are also your hidden extrovert <laughs> no i mean that is a very contrived and deliberate way of of making up for my for the for dryness and the boringness of the personality <laughs> so it's, it's, it's interesting uh, you say that because you know I remember uh, advice that was often uh, uh, given in my poker playing days that if you're at a table and you're very tight and you're folding all the hands you know people might notice and exploit that tightness so what you got to do is you got to talk a lot so people feel you're involved you know and they won't realize that you're actually folding everything but anyway that's a um, boring piece of advice and not relevant beyond a certain stage of play coming back to you know what you said about i mean i have like 30 questions i have to ask from 
from what you have spoken about over the last 10 minutes but i'll go back to your personal journey and i'm sort of struck by uh, this beautiful quote i found in one of your essays and uh, I'll, i'll read it out a quote much of the world cinema i now encountered felt like exercises in coolness and restraint being emotionally undemonstrative myself i was struck by how there wasn't a need to talk all the time how silences in cinema could be meaningful stop quote and you're talking about the time you discovered world cinema as well where this almost seems to mirror that phase in your personal life where your nani is very boisterous and you are quiet and introverted and bollywood is very boisterous and then you discover a kind of cinema that indulges in these silences that has the same kind of uh, skeptical attitude towards religion as it were as you have while your nani is a believer and hindi cinema is a believer and uh, and this got me to thinking about how much are our tastes mirrored by uh, or shaped by our personalities because my default assumption has been that our tastes are like hardwired we are what we are you know for example speaking for myself i like a certain kind of minimalistic understated cinema though i can appreciate why people would like more maximalist uh, uh, cinema i can appreciate them at an intellectual level but what really appeals to me is um, more understated but uh, it, like certainly in uh, your arc and it's obviously not a clear cut arc and all of that but what a little i can make out through your writings it seems that there is this initial distance that you feel between yourselves and say a uh, family or nani or whatever and you turn away from bollywood and at a later stage in life you come back in both senses where of course you start watching bollywood again and appreciating it for what it is but at the same time you've written movingly about how when your nani passed away you you sort of regretted not talking to her more not being with her more all, all of those kind of things and this is also i think at a like at a personal level and it must be true for so many of my listeners that when you're young you want to express your personality you want to break away you want to feel that autonomy and therefore that often means you are kind of going away from your family you 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 look at them in in harsh ways perhaps often because one doesn't have the maturity to you know see the full picture to see the multitudes and then later on in life as as you become an adult yourself sometimes you go you know you go back sometimes you don't sometimes your vision sort of uh, deepens so you know does this make any sense one this connection of the personal and how one relates to the art and entertainment one one sees and do you think that and again i'm thinking aloud my assumption was your taste is what it is but and my taste has changed in different ways over the years but i would have thought it's changed on its own but do you think there is also a way just by thinking about it by consciously thinking about why we like the stuff we like and why we don't like the stuff we like that we can shape our taste as well that we can make ourselves more appreciative of things we might not otherwise have liked like talking to you for example i'm definitely going to go back and revisit some of these films you talk about at the very least look at your essays on these moments and kind of try to see through them and who knows you know that might kind of um, make me look at uh, them in, in in a different way do you think there is that possibility or should one tell oneself that don't get ossified you know keep searching well well as a, as a, you know as a critic as a somebody who's writing about cinema and who's who's so nerdish that that you know he's he's given over a great deal of his life to doing almost nothing but but watching films and thinking about them and trying to articulate thoughts about them uh, i would say and and this is advice that i that i give to anybody you know in, in classes uh, anyone who's trying to be a, a critic or a reviewer the first thing i say is read read please read as much as you possibly can watch as many different types of films as you as you possibly can without getting you know in, into the uh, into ideas of what is a good film what is a bad film you know don't, don't get into uh, ideas about categories being bad once you start dealing with individual films of course you know your your job is going to be to to say that that something worked for you something didn't work for you and then to articulate why it didn't but but don't go into categories thinking that this is innately bad that this sort of genre or this sort of tone or this sort of mode or whatever you know, this 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 style of filmmaking is bad uh, that's one piece of advice i give them now of course even while i'm giving it i know that this is not something you can force your brain to do right and that's what you're saying i mean i'm i'm sure there's something to what you're saying about what a lot of our tastes being hardwired in some contexts i find if you're asking me personally uh, and you're asking me about cinema and maybe about literature as well and my experience has been that my tastes have not been hardwired they've 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 shifted a lot over time and and it's something like as 
implied earlier it's something that i'm quietly proud of the fact that i seem to have the capacity i don't know where it comes from it's not come out of some some delib- deliberate effort uh, you know as far as i know but i seem to have this capacity to appreciate many different types of things which is pretty useful it's a, it's a useful uh, quality to have if you're writing about books and films but that said of course i completely get that it might not come naturally to everybody and that therefore maybe a case can be made that you that you make some sort of effort you you put yourself in this place where you know if you if you're watching films and you you have this this innate resistance to a certain type of film you you don't like the idea of romantic films mushy romantic films or you don't like action films or whatever then if you're trying seriously to be a film critic or a film writer you do have to make a minimum effort i feel to try and get into that world to try and appreciate the terms of that world even this can be very difficult for one very simple reason that you know that, that there are certain genres that people can just have a visceral problem with right a bodily problem with horror horror is the classic example you know especially the jump scare sort of horror i know so many people so many friends who who don't have any snobbery or condescension towards horror at all but who simply cannot watch a horror film because it's it's too much for their nerves they can't deal with it now now if somebody like that wants to become a, a film critic and is then told to go and watch a horror film obviously it's 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 a less than ideal situation i sometimes have a have a problem with very loud action films especially if i'm watching them in a theater with with dolby sound or whatever and and my you know my my, my ears are being assailed i get headaches easily you know so 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 so, so, so there's a bodily response to that which can affect your you know the objectivity quote unquote with which you uh, receive this film or write about it uh, this has been a very raw, long and rambling way of approaching what you what you asked but but yeah i i do feel like we probably are hardwired in many contexts in some contexts maybe including things that that we feel very personally engaged with from an early age as i did with cinema and with literature perhaps one just has sufficient time to explore many different types of books films and to start appreciating them maybe it just works that way and and that's what we call taste changing over time or becoming more inclusive i don't know i don't know if that makes any sense no no makes a lot of sense and before we go into a break let's let's talk a bit about horror because you've got a beautiful chapter in your book uh, popcorn essays about uh, your love for horror cinema and uh, i was especially struck by this lovely line again i'll quote you quote superficial details of time and place scarcely matter anyway as in so many great horror films the setting is really the human soul and it's always night time stop quote and it strikes me that you know people who are into high art and high literature and of uh, so on often tend to sort of condescend sent to the genres like horror and science fiction but i think that many of the finest explorations of what it is to be human actually come from within the genres like uh, like there's a 1980 film i recommend uh, everybody watches which i had written a column about i'll post it from the show notes called cannibal holocaust and it was directed by this guy called rogero diodato and cannibal holocaust is it's it's really one of those found film things where these people discover these videotapes which were shot by these filmmakers who had gone to some remote jungle angles uh, where they were filming cannibals and it almost it, it served as an allegory of something that didn't exist yet which is this sort of instagram age where you're documenting everything everything is a selfie which you know i, I wouldn't say not exists yet because that innate urge for uh, self documentation and the performative urge i guess was always there in all of us technologies enabled it in new ways and basically they keep filming each other one of them dies one of them you know has his vital organs chopped off and burnt and all kinds of nonsense is happening and they're filming everything and eventually they end up filming their own sort of deaths and at one level it's just a gory horror film at another level i just found it incredibly profound in all these human instincts that it is kind of looking at and the interesting thing is a guy who directed that film rogero diodato and this was a 1980 film he went on to act in hostel 2 by eli roth where in a lovely scene he plays this sort of cannibal client who is uh, you know out of a live uh, person uh, he's carving out a, a steak as it were while uh, you know bide is playing in the background a very elegant scene in the hostel films also are sort of fascinating looks at addiction and consumerism and all of these things tell me a little bit about your journey through uh, horror and i i mean i have of course watched way way less than you and the, the, you know these are just kind of selective impressions 
but you've probably you know watched everything there is in horror no no i i have haven't i haven't, haven't come close to watching everything there is in horror i haven't watched so much of the more contemporary stuff or the the stuff of the last 20 25 years where do, where does one begin one thing i can say is that i'm glad that you mentioned the hostel films which again i haven't seen but but from what i know about them those are fairly mainstream horror films right those aren't yeah, uh, those yeah, those yeah. iso they they those aren't uh, respectable horror films which is which is a which is which is a new category of 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 film that I, that i've become very nervous about having said that one should not judge categories or uh, i will i will now say that the, the respectable horror film is this this uh, this category that i'm very nervous about because what it leads to in my experience is a lot of young woke critics talking about how so and so film made by jordan peel or or whoever isn't just a horror film it isn't a mere horror film it is something more and speaking as someone who loves mere horror films and who has been endlessly stimulated by them i start getting very suspicious when a when a film is described as something more than a horror film as if as if horror is something that is that is innately disrespectful or disrespectable and, uh, and 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 you have these you know once once a very overt layer of social commentary comes into it you know it's like oh this is a horror film nahi hai this is something that that happened i remember recently in, in the indian context with uh, with this the, the, these the latest of these often tedious anthologies that come out on netflix uh, where where the barker and anurag and zoya and uh, karan johar um, are making making short films uh, so, so so there was the ghost stories one where everybody was raving about the barker's film and you know and i saw it and i liked it moderately and then then you know i started just reading some of the reviews and then all the reviews were just going on and on about how you know this is a film that just takes horror to a new level because it's, because it's got this this very you know what, what to my eyes was fairly clearly and explicitly spelt out social commentary you know about the current state of affairs or whatever you know the 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 the, the world that we are currently living in Uh, and it used a broad horror f- framework to do that but but it just became one of those things that everybody was raving about and i was thinking listen horror has always had subtexts horror is a subtext to begin with you know you go back and read about the history of cinema the earliest films when pictures first started moving on walls and the first generation of film viewers had to deal with this horrific thing happening in front of them you know pictures moving in front of them and then this this horrible ghastly thing called the called the cut came along where 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 there's a cut from one scene to a completely unrelated scene and the shock that would have provided to the, the to the nervous systems of the first generations of viewers horror is built into cine- cinema's dna to start with you know it's it it taps into into some of the, uh, some of our deepest fears about technology about about where we can go with it so so the subtext is there to begin with even before you start exploring what what the theme of a particular film is even before you start talking about whether you know whether dracula has this or whether 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 frankenstein has this deep rooted theme about about uh, man playing god or whatever it is in the context of cinema horror is just you know it's it's it really is i mean you could make the case that it's a, that is an it's it's a synonym for cinema cinema it's it's just another word for cinema and uh, i find it a little uh, for lack of a better word i find it a bit pretentious when when people are constantly looking for uh, horror films having these these very explicit layers of social commentary in them this is not to say that a that a jordan peel film is not a good film in its own right you know for, for what it is it's just that i feel like i've got a bit of a mental block against that sort of reaction to to horror cinema Uh, which is also why to come back to what i was saying earlier i'm glad to hear you talk about uh, the more low brow quote on quote films like hostel or cannibal holocaust or whatever uh, again there's been lots of personal resonance for me you know you know the, coming back to the the parent child theme that that i've always found interesting in in a lot of the art that i've consumed uh, psycho is one thing there there's, there's this wonderful film uh, this french film called uh, eyes without a face which is which is the english title by 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 george franju which was also 1960 or 61 which which is uh, pretty gruesome in some ways though of course it's it's undercut by the fact that it's a black and white film about a, a, a young woman whose face has been disfigured and her mad scientist father who's trying to set her right by finding other 
young women whose faces can be you know whose, who do they can be used for the purpose quite grisly in terms of its subject matter but 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 again a very moving film in many ways and just if you just look at it in terms of the father daughter scenes in it and the desperation of this man who is a horror movie monster but is also a, a tormented father you know the things like that have have always uh, you know hit me in in you know in, in some place that i can't fully articulate Yeah, lots to explore there, which we'll do as the show goes along. You know how uh, your political lens can influence the way you look at art. How young people today perhaps consume art and discover art, and how they view it. All fascinating. But before we go in for a break, uh, you know, you were talking about the spectacle of the early movie uh, watcher, the phenomenon of the cut and all that. So I just want to read out this uh, lovely quote by you about the magical quality of films, uh, where you write, "Quote: There's a popular story from the earliest days of moving pictures about the unprepared viewers of a Lumiere Brothers short." Film. Film who ran out of a Paris theater when confronted with the image of a train seemingly coming towards them. This is probably apocryphal, but there are other similar, less dramatic stories from that period. And even common sense tells us that the first movie viewers must have experienced quite a few shocks to the system. Today, even the most casual viewers unconsciously process such aspects of film grammar as cross-cutting between unrelated scenes. But in the earlier days, even basic cutting from one image to another, let alone rapid-fire splicing, must have felt other. worldly to some it must have been frightening even demoniac was that puffing train the first movie monster stop quote and and by the way this this also we take cinema for granted we are not struck by any of it as such but uh, this was something that was that even perhaps this view of cinema as something that influences people more profoundly than say books or art do was something that led to our censorship laws because you know back in the 50s or 60s or whenever the censor board was founded one of the reasons for having much harsher restrictions on cinema as opposed to say books was that uh, you know cinema influences naive people in all these deep ways and therefore we must uh, you know protect them that whole paternalism came from there and thankfully that you know books were not uh, subject to the same thing but uh, let's take a quick commercial break there is so much to talk about that we'll i feel like we'll need another 3 hours On the seen and the unseen I often speak about positive sum games. Well, if you want to be surrounded by beauty and you love fine art, I have a win-win proposition for you. Head on over to indiancolors.com. Indian Colors licenses images of fine art from some of the best contemporary artists in India and adapts them to objects of everyday use like tote bags, pouches and home decor items. You get to surround yourself with the finest modern Indian art at affordable prices and artists get royalties for every product you buy. Win-win game. The Indian Colors new range is in and includes elegant yet comfortable dresses for women and casual shirts for men. with stand out motifs by artists such as Tanmoy Samanta, Manisha Gera Baswari, Shruti Nelson, Pradeep Mishra and Jaydeep Mehrotra. Stay home but dress smart. And if you're missing your friends in these lockdown days worry not, you can show them you're thinking of them by buying gifts for them from Indian Colors. Corporate gifting is also available. So head on over to indiancolors.com and ask colors with an OU and make art a part of your life. And hey, for a 15% discount, use the code unseen. That's right. unseen for 15% off at indiancolors.com welcome back to the scene in the unseen i'm chatting with jay arjun singh about films books writing all of those things let's talk about something that we've in fact discussed in the past because you know one of the realizations i came to early on and in a sense i went through a, a similar journey to yours where as a kid i uh, used to look down a little bit on bollywood uh, partly because uh, you know my father was director of the ftii between uh, 86 and 91 so i grew up at home just watching world cinema all the time i didn't even know that these were like kind of two sep- separate things uh, I-, i just didn't think of it that way so it was a question of taste that i liked a certain kind of cinema much more than the other and as a young kid i looked down on one of them as well now as one grows older obviously i i wouldn't say that i'm a full fledged mainstream hindi film lover that i am not but i I do recognize that it is a category error in uh, uh, my view and we'll discuss this and we've spoken about this that I sort of came to the recognition at one point in time that it's a category error to judge a Hindi film as it were by the same parameters by which I look at a Western film because they're so completely different they're trying to do completely different things they're almost different art forms so one has to sort of uh, just shift one's frame of reference to enjoy one over the other now there's an interesting quote by you which again I'll read out 
where you indicate that this is a bit of a false dichotomy. And here's what you say, quote, I don't want to make a facile comparison that goes, Hindi cinema is equal to loud melodrama, European cinema is equal to understated realism. It's much more complex than that. Each of these forms has many modes of expression and cultures and behaviors around the world are far from homogenous. An Indian film that depicted the melodramatic behavior of someone like my grandmother or many other similar people I knew could be realistic and truthful. But many viewers, even Indian viewers who know this culture well, might instinctively denounce it as over the top. And much of European cinema, some Italian genres for example, is loud, goofy or hyperdramatic in ways that are comparable to the mainstream Hindi film. Stop quote. And, and this point about Italian films is great because one of my favorite directors growing up was Fellini. And one of the Fellini films that I really loved, which critics don't talk about in the canon, but I really loved it, is a film called Amar Kod, you know, which has all these uh, uh, sort of Italian families behaving in really boisterous, dramatic ways and uh, Italians in many ways are like Italians seem to me to be the European Bengalis uh, in some of the melodrama and extreme emotion and of course one of my favourite films of childhood was uh, Fellini's brilliant Eve with Aloni, a fantastic coming of age film that uh, spoke so much to me. But to kind of get back to the subject at hand that one there is of course a, a difference but what you're also pointing out is that there's no strict boundary between the two. Uh, how has your thinking on this evolved uh, over these many years? Like, I presume that you shared some of that initial sort of snobbishness and got over it and realized not to make value judgments at all. But um, how does one look at it? Do you have to sort of quote shift, so to say, when you view one kind of cinema over the other? How, how, how does it all work for you? Not at a conscious level. I mean, oh, uh, my, I'm sure there must be some sort of mental shift that happens. But uh, as of now, I don't think it's conscious at all. I, I, I find it quite easy at most times to, to watch a particular sort of film on one day and watch a very different sort of film the next day without really thinking in terms of... Uh, and, I, and, I, and I suppose most people don't really do that. I mean, how do you consciously make that shift anyway, right? You're just... Uh, uh, it's not like I, I, I start the film saying, okay deep breath, count to 10, this is going to be this sort of film. That was, you know, it, it, it's nothing like that. I, I, I think it's just a question of receiving whatever film it is and then seeing if that individual film works for you or not. And then, you know, of course, if you're, if you're doing this professionally and you have to write a piece about it, then, then the, the big thing you have to do is to articulate as well as possible why it worked for you or why it didn't work for you. Uh, and in the process of that articulation also, I, I don't usually feel the need to put down things like, uh, though, though, as you mentioned, I do tend to be defensive in many ways. And some of that defensiveness does occasionally come into my writing when I'm writing about a really mainstream Hindi film, which I know tends to be the subject of snobbery from a lot of the people around me. That does come in sometimes. But generally speaking, I'm not really, uh, even in my writing, I'm not really trying to describe what the the assumptions that you have to make while watching this particular type of film uh, or anything like that. I just, I, I just take it as a given that there are many different modes of expression and that there are so many ways of uh, expressing emotion uh, truthfully and that, that truthfulness doesn't have to be synonymous with understatement for instance to take take a take a, take a really obvious example you asked something else before this right I've, I've gone off on a tangent again as i do no it was sort of about your uh, thinking about this dichotomy and, and and just to kind of you know double click again as as a film critic like you said when you're writing about it it seems to me that there is a, a, a certain dissonance, and I'm just thinking aloud, uh, a certain dissonance in this, in, in writing about a particular kind of film and another kind of film, where the reader would probably expect you to have a similar sense of, uh, use a similar bunch of parameters or metrics to talk about these films, and actually you cannot do that. Like when you talk about a film like Moonlight, for example, right, which I loved so much, I thought it's the best film to win a best film Oscar when it did just such a great moving film. And 
and very understated as well right now if within moonlight there was any moment where that understatement breaks and when a character says what he is feeling it would be a tremendous false note it would it would just mar the sort of the unity of the film and what held it together but uh, so you know that would become a, a parameter for that film but at the same time if you're watching a hindi film that kind of expression almost a spoon feeding of the audience as it were would almost be routine and not thought of as something that is a problem and at some level of course it is how unified is a voice of the film that that film has chosen one particular voice and this film might have chosen another particular voice but at the same time it is almost as if we look at these two different kinds of cinema through a different set of values like i love david dhawan films okay you can judge me for it in these uh, times as well so i love david dhawan films but i also love kislovsky but the point is a set of values through which i look at those films and the expectations i have are completely different and of course multitudes and all of that uh, but i guess you could say that the reader also takes that for granted so you can't need to spell any of it out or adjust for it no no what what i'm really saying is uh, i suppose is that uh, Uh, there, uh, uh, there isn't a particular way in which I experience that shift while you know moving from one type of film to another. I don't know what that means. That I, I don't know what that says about me or my brain or whatever it is. But but uh, but uh, but I uh, uh, and also uh, since you bring up Moonlight, but is one little point which which I think is uh, you know might also go some way to uh, might also be a reminder that. there are so many different ways of loving the same film right now and now, now, now i know you love moonlight I, i loved it as well i i saw it on in, uh, in the hall but but some of the, the the scenes that worked best for me in that film i actually thought that the background music was 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 very lush almost i don't know you you probably didn't feel that way uh, I, i felt it was insistent in a very good way i know it, it it served as a sort of i i wouldn't use a term like spoon feeding but but uh, it served as some sort of an emotional cue for me especially in some of the dialogueless scenes like the one where the protagonist has you know the the, the one in the swimming pool for instance uh, scenes like that i felt like my experience of the film was actually enhanced by the use of music which which i didn't think of as particularly subtle music i thought of it as you providing in a way now i'm going to assume that you didn't feel the same way at all even though you love the film as well so i you know i i have to say that i didn't notice it at all so number one i, I the fact that i didn't notice it is a good thing uh, it, it means that it didn't uh, draw attention to itself and all of that and secondly i think like i uh, told you i think some of my views on this have changed slightly in the sense that i now realize that all of cinema every choice you make is in a sense manipulating the viewer whether it is to have a particular kind of music or to not have that music so i am a little more open to um, uh, these sort of things than i used to be once where once i was like no i don't want to be manipulated if there is a sad scene do not play sad violin music uh, you know do not play shenai at this time and you know uh, in, in an action scene you don't need to play action music just let shit happen now i'm a little more relaxed i understand that in any case it's a curated experience so let you know unless something is jarring and is detracting from that experience let me just sit back and enjoy the experience without sort of deconstructing it too much but i'm sorry continue no that, that's pretty much all i had to say it, it was just you know that just a reminder and is something that uh, you know when you're thinking in this nerdish way about not just about films but also about the nuts and bolts of film appreciation film criticism uh, you do think about these things about how you know you and i can go together in a post covid world we can go into go into a hall together and, and watch a film together come out gushing about it saying you that was that was great it was such a great film and, and then we go and sit down and have coffee somewhere and start talking about the film and then we realize that we we liked completely different things in the film and that maybe we disagreed about something very important you know the the quality of a particular performance maybe maybe i thought the the performance was the best thing in the film and made the film for me you had reservations about the performance but it wasn't anything like a deal breaker for you so so everything else in the film more than made up for the for it so at the end of that coffee we we've, we've actually discovered that 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 we've had very different experiences of the film but we for each of us it is a five star film you know so so uh, just uh, just a little thing that you know that uh, these are some of the conversations that come up the few occasions that i that i talk about these things with with other movie lovers or with other professional film critics that there are so many ways it's it's very reductive to think that oh you know person a and person b both love the same film so their tastes match 
it's it's not it's not necessarily the case it's uh, there there's so many different ways of liking or not liking or being indifferent to a film or a book or whatever no and this leads me to a further thought about the discourse right if this was to happen let's say post covid times you can go watch a movie together what would be that conversation we would have about the film uh, would further enrich the experience of the film if we are receptive and listening to each other because then you can see the film from my eyes later and i can go back and i'll probably whenever i watch moonlight again i'll um, you know i'll be more uh, uh, sort of uh, mindful of these things that you speak about and it strikes me right in much of our discourse we don't have that receptiveness anymore much of our discourse is where you take a hard and position that this is what i feel and everyone else who disagrees with me has a character flaw that they are stupid or they are evil or they are whatever and uh, so much of our discourse has become like that a little less on cinema but even on cinema as you've pointed out you've written in the past about you know when you would write a bad review of something somebody else would say how could you not like that you know you weren't being objective whereas you pointed out objective means you you know you should agree with me so just a kind of a point about the discourse no one of the ways in which you see these two worlds colliding these two uh, almost these different philosophies and I, i'll i'll still speak of it in dichotomous terms so i i buy your point that there's an intermingling is say in a film like piku now you've mentioned piku in the past in the context of acting where some people you know appreciated deepika's uh, quote and quote understated performance there and you pointed out that no she's been good in so many other films and but it is only you know why are we applying this particular lens or this particular value and saying she's good in this but i also thought of piku as showcasing these two forms coming together in terms of the way amitabh and irfan acted where i thought Ir- irfan is was sadly uh, just an incredibly great actor by uh, any standard and you know uh, while amitabh like in that film i thought irfan's acting was superb and amitabh was just hamming it up and it was classic bollywood and you have made these categories of actor and star actor and he's basically just been a star actor all the way through and he's been extremely good so no value judgment there per se but you you sort of see these two different schools of acting come together where irfan is just living breathing the character and amitabh is just hamming it's just you know not good acting in my book but that is of course through uh, you know my uh, sort of biased lens Am- amitabh in his own context is a great great actor uh, that hardly needs to be elaborated upon uh, can i can i interrupt for a second yeah sure yeah probably make a make a habit of uh, just riffing on what what the other is saying i actually actually wrote another piece once which 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 you you were probably haven't read Uh, explaining why i was very moved by bachchan's performance in piko uh, and uh, and in fact i've i've spoken about this also recently in a class because uh, because i uh, you know most of the people i know which which of course say something about the circles again that that i tend to associate with share your view of of the bachchan performance as as being an exercise in hamming and and of course a lot of these people a lot of the people who hold this view are also also happen to be bengalis who think that uh, this is a a stereotype a, a stereotypical depiction of the bengali now of course i uh, at risk of being very politically un- incorrect here i have to say that speaking as a north indian who who has experienced a lot of real world bengalis as stereotypes i had no trouble at all <laughs> uh, uh, buying into bachchan's performance uh, and, and i think perhaps you know a lot of defensive bengalis are perhaps not the best people to be making that judgment but but that's a separate uh, look you know i'm i'm half bong but that is not my criticism at all yeah, i, mean, yeah, I don't care about yeah, that yeah, i'm not saying yeah, i'm not saying it is but, but but yeah there are many others who most people i know in fact in the in the you know the the film writers world the writers world even if they didn't really or uh, even if they weren't bold enough to say it in their reviews thought bachchan was not very good in the film hamming and hamming etc etc Uh, but, but but this actually leads me to a talking point that might be relevant to something that we were discussing earlier as well about how our personal experiences often um, illuminate or help us make sense of certain things or or in fact how we receive films or performances the reason why bachchan's performance really worked for me and in fact just sort of you know moved me in a in a way that that I, that i just you know the, again had a hard time articulating was because there were, there were these little moments in the performance and i'm not even talking about the performance in its entirety but there were these little moments in the performance that speaking as someone who has spent a lot of time either caregiving himself in the last few years or witnessing caregiving 
uh, in the context of of my nani's uh, final battle with cancer and my mother looking after her and my mother who's also a very introverted person just putting her life on hold and and having to deal with this parent who was a completely different personality type who wanted to bully her daughter but was also very scared about her condition and I knew that she was dependent on her daughter so you have that combination of wanting to exercise hegemony as as this very extroverted you know boisterous person but also being very scared and and, and nervous ke you know ke ke main aise kuch nahi bol dun that i shouldn't say something that will get mala upset mala mala is my mother and and i saw this look in my nani's eyes so often you know in 2007 2008 2009 when the cancer cancer period was going on and i saw exactly that same look you know in some scenes in piku where where deepika just sort of loses it where the bachan character is being you know he's, he's he's being difficult and and the daughter loses it and she starts shouting at him or just sort of say something and then you know there's you either see him in 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 a, in a direct shot or in as part of a larger scene the way he's looking at her uh, just you know it just felt so truthful to me it just reminded me exactly of of that of that look in my nani's eyes looking at my mother and I, and i just felt like this this guy has captured something about about this personality type being in this situation being being looked after by a child and 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 and, and becoming the child who is being looked after by his child so 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 it worked for me purely in that at that level i mean i mean i mean i'm absolutely fine with with people saying that the performance felt hammy or whatever and and of course you know there there are so many different ways of judging these things your feelings about a performance will also be again i'm not talking about you but but some other people's feelings about the performance might be affected by the fact that that he won a national award for it he was given a national award for it so then people will look at the film with that level of expectation and then they'll say listen irfan is so much better and he is you know he's it's such a natural you know you you barely register that he's acting and he was this old man who's just hamming it up in every scene but and he got a national award for hamming so so people will we will also look at it from that point of view but i had a very personal response to the performance and i and, and i enjoyed it for that reason this is kind of fascinating if i ever come across piku running anywhere on tv because i don't think i'll go out of my way to watch it but if i come across it running anywhere i will uh, watch out for this no seriously with an open mind there is a delightful quote uh, in one of your pieces in fact which i'll link from the show notes where you quote subhash gai uh, when he's asked about you know meryl streep and susan sarandon do we have actresses like that in india and he said quote can they dance as convincingly as madhuri dikshit does so, uh, stop quote which is of course a lovely way of looking at it let's let's kind of go, now go back to talking about the, the personal journey and 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 let's sort of come to blogging like one of the reasons blogging was significant for me as a writer it was significant in various ways but like you i had a conventional journalism job where i wrote conventional pieces in conventional formats and blogging was different because of all the you know standard reasons you and i know that number one you are not restricted by format you can do 80 words or 8000 words you don't have to do 800 you're not restricted by uh, uh, say the news cycle you don't have to write about what is topical you can write about anything you're not constrained by house style and in a certain sense you aren't constrained by anxiety as well because Uh, you know one of the things that often stops writers or gets in the way is their anxiety of what other people think of them um, my approach initially as a blogger was i'm just blogging who gives a who's going to read it you know and you get into that groove where that self consciousness kind of goes and all of these together came to being something liberating and in my uh, newsletter i had an essay about this uh, uh, about form and content and also in the context of you know um, the, the podcast where, where my postulation is that doing a 3 hour podcast as opposed to a 10 minute podcast means i'm having a completely different kind of conversation i have to delve that much deeper i have to do that much more research i have to respect the guest that much more i have to be that much more patient i have to listen genuinely listen that much more and all of this affects who i am as a person and changes me in subtle ways especially if i'm doing it for a period of years similarly in blogging i think it shaped my writing because throwing away all these restrictions and not having to write to the expectations of an editor or an audience just allowed me to branch out in all kinds of different directions and all of that and i think that that at the end of that period when like i wrote 8000 posts over 5 years i would do five posts a day as you know uh, on average i think my record was 18 posts in a day so i was you know great writing gym for me getting a lot of writing done uh, without realizing it or thinking of it that way but i do feel that it kind of 
it changed the work i did it changed, therefore it changed the way i thought because the imperatives were different and it changed the person i am like i genuinely think that if anything and this is of course in a relative sense but the podcast has made me a better person because i listen more and i'm more open and i'm more sort of whatever so what did blogging mean to you in that sense and obviously this is only in hindsight at the time one never knows but how did it shape you how did it shape your writing how did it shape the way you looked at cinema because before this cinema in our newspapers was cheso word ka review you have to talk about plot you have to give a verdict you have to give a star rating and that's it but now suddenly you're writing personal essays you're writing stray observations what was it like no well, well uh, first of all uh, you're, you're being very kind when you say 600 words in uh, in mainstream publications <laughs> it, it was closer to 300 or 400 uh the uh, i i had worked for a the, the, for the, the, the for an india today tabloid in my first job in journalism and and i of course that that was a very small 16 page publication uh, but the reviews i would do book reviews or film reviews were never more than 350 400 words uh, it, it it was far from the ideal way of doing it but when you when you're that young you, you you'll have a boss coming up to you in the middle of the many other things you have to do uh, in a day and just sort of tossing a book at you and saying yeah it is a 400 page book and saying iska kal review de dena give the review by tomorrow and that of course just just tells you the first message that gives you as a young journalist is that reviewing is not taken seriously is not something to be taken seriously is not considered a form in its own right it's not considered uh, something that can be good writing or good thinking in its own right it's just something that you know you that you just do anybody can do it Uh, what's important anyway is the star rating that will go with your piece because because that's what the vast majority of readers, uh, including my mother by the way, uh, they would look mm-hmm. at. <laughs> even even after after I was writing as uh, even even after I started doing film pieces myself, uh, my my mother would still be looking at the at the Times of India piece to see what uh, what the star rating was. Uh, so of course you know they, uh, working purely for mainstream publications as a journalist at that time and possibly even at this time at the current time. this meant that you're not uh, you don't have the tools to take yourself very seriously as a reviewer or as a as a critic or to, or, or to think of it as something that requires uh, rigor or, or think of a review as something that can be well written well articulated that can be a personal thing and of course uh, pretty much everything you said about blogging applies to me too uh, except that i i might uh, Uh, i don't know if it would be completely truthful to say that that i uh, didn't feel any peer pressure at all or any burden of expectations because i think a time probably did arrive and I, i can't really think of any specific cases just now but a, a point did arrive when after the blog became widely read you know during that that heady period of 2004 2005 2006 before social media had come along before there was uh, all this uh, clutter on the internet and blogs were still being read quite widely and and as you might know one of the reasons why it became possible for me to become a freelance writer and an independent writer working from home working for multiple publications was because i was getting job offers from other publications based purely on the blog writing uh not on my writing in business standard where i was working at the time so 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 it was a very heady time and and once you became aware that senior editors and different publications know jabber walk know your your blog jabber walk and you know and obviously somewhere you start becoming a little self conscious i think that did happen to me somewhere i uh, became a little nervous as well uh, but uh, i don't think it happened to a great degree i don't think it happened it happened to a crippling degree where 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 the right the writing became a chore or became more difficult to pull off and ultimately of course what happened was that to more directly answer uh, your question what it did for me in, in addition to to what you said yourself about just giving you a space where you could write an 80000 word piece if you wanted to uh, hypothetically or definitely a 1500 word 2000 word piece on a particular aspect of a book or a film rather than a holistic review uh, a, a holistic structured review of the book or the film which is something whimsical but detailed at the same time obviously the the blogging format did that for me but also what it did was because at, at the time like i said i was working for business standard newspaper i had started doing a few book reviews for them for the edit the edit page but mostly what i was doing at that time was still this very corporate writing i was i was doing these corporate stories on the watch industry on the jewelry industry whatever stuff that i wasn't genuinely interested in and 
because prior to that in the only film reviews or the only book reviews i had written were for that tabloid that i mentioned 300 word spaces 400 word spaces i perhaps lacked uh, the confidence that i could do this you know in a in a proper consolidated way in the long format and what the blog did for me was especially when when the blog post started getting a good response was that it it told me that yes i could write a 1500 word piece about a film or a film essay that was appreciated by other people and that therefore my sensibility you know struck a chord for other people it told me that and that gave me the confidence that I, that i needed to ultimately go on and write longer pieces for official publication you if you remember the, the little more than 10 years ago you uh, gave me a column space for yahoo which again a uh, you know was the sort of space where i could write longish pieces now again without the blog ha- having happened a few years before that i might not have had the confidence to to write officially published pieces for payment for writers like amit verma and prem panekar who who, who i admired uh, and i might not have had that confidence you know, without the the validation provided by the blog so so that's really it i think you know finding one's voice feeling like it was sustainable to to write longish pieces about cinema or literature or whatever and uh, and that it would make some sense to someone that's what it was about you yeah for my listeners i used to be a consulting editor at yahoo briefly i basically put together and ran a column section for them which included columns by among other people jay arjun singh and i think you used to alternate with sanjay sipai malani on on books another sort of uh, fantastic uh, writer the two of you were my sort of art and culture people and we had others for politics and society and uh, this and that no and going back to uh, you, you know the similar process that happened to you where you said that people started taking your film writing seriously because of the blog and a similar the process happened with me in the sense that look i was i i used to work at cricket info i used to write in cricket but because of the blog where i wrote about everything i got that column in mint for which i won the bastia prize uh, i used to write regularly for the wall street journal back in the day so everything kind of came from there though none of that was intended and the happiest writing i did was actually for the blog itself because absolutely no limitations and the other uh, way in which it helped me and which is why i advise people today to start a blog or a newsletter because blogs are kind of dead but uh, something is is that you're writing regularly that iteration matters you're writing repeatedly uh, hopefully without self consciousness and that iteration just matters not just in making you a better writer and polishing the craft but also uh, it, it kind of makes you uh, a better thinker now my next question is this that at at this time you all you're writing about films and one aspect of writing about films that we discussed is that it makes you look deeper at films that you no longer have that intuitive or at initial or at visceral reaction to a film you actually have to think about it figure out what you want to write about it go deeper into that aspect of yourself and all of that but it strikes me that there's another danger and and that danger is taking this too far of looking for significance where there is none because you have to have something to write about almost a risk of over analysis as it were and in your self deprecatory way you've pointed out one example of this in the past uh, i think in a tedx talk you gave where you spoke about the scene from janavi do yaro you know where everybody is sort of silhouetted uh, that they go up this building and they're silhouetted and uh, uh, in the sky and you know these guys are just silhouettes and you spoke about how uh, the, the, this sort of seemed to be symbolic of their kale karname but when you mentioned it to kundan shah the director he said oh jay you're being a critic again aisa kuch nahi hai you know and i'm reminded about this and i try to watch out for it in myself when i write about books or films uh, because critics do tend to do this like i remember one of my favorite films as a kid growing up because i saw it at that age when it is likely to appeal to people of that age was the peter weir film dead poet society and a couple of years later my dad got one of these foreign film magazines where i read someone talking about dead poet society about having all these homoerotic overtones and all of that which i was completely sure is just way over interpreting uh, what it actually was you know reading far more into a story than you need to so is this something that you felt that you had to watch out for do you think you ever cross the line uh, you know would you know when you cross the line because at some level obviously everything is subjective and you can only speak about how the film affects you and what it means to you but at the same time there is a risk of 
kind of going too far reading into the film things that the director never intended or uh, just weren't there just because you know that's a fascinating narrative for you so is this something you've thought about do you do you look back on some of the earlier stuff you've done and say that hey no no that was that that was wrong or um, uh, you know i overthought that Well, you know the short answer to that would be no i, I don't and, uh, uh, and and i have to say this uh, uh, what the director in consciously intended or what what a novelist consciously intended uh, you know sh- should be completely irrelevant to a good critic anyway it is not something that i mean i am firmly with again to come to another cliche but but i i uh, you know firmly believe in d h lawrence's dictum about you know trusting the artist trusting the tale and uh, now the thing is uh, that, uh, that example you provided wo jaane bhi to yaar ho by the way uh, there, there was actually a follow up to it which, which i think maybe maybe you don't know about or maybe i i don't remember if i put it it may not have been in the book but but i think i may have written it uh, elsewhere when i spoke with dinod pradhan the the dop of the film uh, later may even have been after i did the book or uh, i can't remember the exact sequence of events he actually told me that you know though of course the uh, the fact that the scene was shot in that particular way that silhouetted way where the four villains the four conspirators are you know see them in the shadowy sort of way the fact that it was done was was first and foremost because they had run out of time and they only had that had the top of that building for uh, for a certain amount of time but vinod pradhan also said that you know but but you know when we found ourselves with this constraint i went up to kundan and said listen but you know this would actually make for for quite a nice atmospheric shot given given the black deeds that are being uh, you know being being discussed out here and uh, you know i, I did sort of and, and he said this but vinod said this independently of my having brought up anything uh, in terms of interpretation so uh, so that is one thing having said that even if he hadn't said it even if vinod pradhan hadn't provided this counter narrative to what kundan kundan provided and i should also uh, specify that kundan himself though he he was very snarky with me at various times when it's snarky in a nice way uh, in a way that 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 a creative person often is with with an impudent young critic who is who is trying to read a lot of things into his work uh, because creative people do tend to feel be very proprietary about what they have done they they, uh, they tend to feel like they need to have full control over it and that therefore other 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 interpretations that they did not consciously intend are a problem uh, everything should just be there many many creative people are like that uh, even kundan in a more relaxed frame of mind did subsequently say to me yeah but you know listen it's it, as a critic it is your job to find your interpretations and to and to look at what is there in the frame kundan had after all been at fdii himself as a student and he would have would have picked up on that you know would have uh, watching hundreds and hundreds of films and uh, be, be being taught to think about them in personal ways so yeah so, so my, my uh, basic position is if there is one is that there is no such thing as over analysis subtextual analysis is great of course it's not that simple because of course you know when we're talking about over analysis we are still talking about engaging with what is in the frame of the film if you're talking about a particular scene or whatever you look at what is in the frame or in the case of a novel you look at what is on the page the words that have been used there now if i were to hypothetically i were to uh, watch a film where you know just say say a hindi film where Uh, a villain, villain played by Ajit, and one of those impossibly opulent villains, Les, with pink sofas and a and 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 a pool with a shark swimming in it, waiting to wait, waiting to chew up heroes. Uh, uh, if I were to write about that scene and say, you know, what's happening here is Ajit isn't a bad guy, but there's an invisible pink unicorn sitting on that pink sofa, and he ha- he he is wired into a jeet and he is making a jeet do all these bad things and of course you can't see most people can't see the unicorn because he's invisible and also because he's he's a little less pink than that bright pink sofa but that is it that's the, you know the the real thing that's happening here is that the unicorn is making a jeet do all these bad things now if i were to say that it, it might still be a fairly entertaining take on the film it might even sort of be a way of overlaying fiction on an existing palimpsest but it probably wouldn't be good criticism right i think it's safe to say that that, that it wouldn't be valid criticism because you know you you you're dealing with something that is not palpably in the frame but once you're dealing with things that are actually there you know and at whatever level because the film is made up of so many different choices some of which 
could be unconscious choices or subconscious choices or the result of different departments working together collaborating you can have a scene where an actor is doing a particular thing there's a line of dialogue there's something happening at the level of the of the costume design something happening at the level of the set design camera movement shot composition whatever now when you're looking at all of that in its entirety of course it's fair game for a critic to to talk about that and to you know maybe relate it to something else that has happened in the same film or something else that has happened in a different work made by the same director or something like that it's it's completely fair game i don't think it's uh, you know as long as you can justify your you know whatever you've interpreted in accordance with what is actually there in the scene after that it's not uh, to my mind it's not particularly interesting or relevant what the what the filmmaker himself was consciously trying to do i don't think that is something that the critic that the critic needs to be concerned with at all fair enough no it's 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 uh, i both kind of agree and disagree i agree with your basic point but i can see that sometimes overthinking it can become a bad thing for example let's take the pink sofa now i think the pink unicorn is a bit much because you're adding a plot element and all of that but one way that scene could be interpreted is that a, a young critic today could interpret it and say that look what ajit is actually doing is that with the pinkness of the sofa by choosing a pink sofa he's expressing his his repressed feminine side it's actually a little bit metrosexual that he's got a pink sofa and all these heroes who are coming to rescue the heroine by the act of trying to rescue a woman they are expressing a paternalism and a patriarchal bent of mind and he's feeding that toxic masculinity to the sharks in the pool right now the, the, all of this is coherent but it's clearly nonsense i mean you 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 have a career as an academic critic <laughs> <laughs> yeah but the, the thing is here is where the director's intent does matter because none of this is intended all of this is coherent point very well <laughs> yeah, is... uh, uh, that's a point very well made uh, having said that i think you know so so yeah so that's so why i think the safe thing to do is to say that we are all going to be making our own value judgments about yeah. about where the point lies where you perhaps go overboard with with analysis and interpretation that's a, that's a very good example uh, that you just came up with on the fly like that but uh, i can i also feel like i have read particularly in the field of academia and and what i would consider good academia which is which is a very tiny minority of the academia i've read because because much of what i've read you know especially when it comes to academia around hindi cinema just just seems to be tedious uh, uh, above everything else but it, but in the in what i see as the as the well expressed uh, serious minded acad- academic writing i have actually seen things that are not that far from this deliberately exaggerated example that you provided and and i have been able to sort of go along with it to some degree no no i don't mean to diss all analysis i'm i'm just saying that there is a danger of overthinking and and, and does one watch out for it and you know did this reminded me of a, a story about myself and is fairly self deprecatory because i end up looking very stupid in it so why not share it which is that when i was in uh, college in my teens so this would probably be 91 92 your seminal year 91 for example for all we know so i was in ferguson college in pune and in our neighboring college i think in gokhale uh, there was an art exhibition and uh, hussein's works were among those that were put up and uh, i don't remember the occasion at all or why hussein's works would be put up in a college exhibition but there was something by hussein there and hussein himself was around gracing the occasion so i went there with um, an acquaintance of mine my host my neighbor in the hostel and we were looking at a hussein painting and there was some candle in it so my neighbor looked at me and said you know what that candle is i think that represents a hope of humanity so i was like nay yaar a great artist like hussein would never do such cheap symbolism so anyway then hussein comes near the painting and somebody you know thrusts a mic in his face and says sir can you tell us about this painting what is that candle doing there and hussein says that's meant to represent the hope of humanity <laughs> almost identical words and i just wanted to sink into the ground ki ye kya ho gaya but anyway to 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 sort of <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll uh, pick up on one of the uh, things you said where uh, and I agree with you in this particular thing that you said where you said that you have to look at a piece of art on its own and divorce it of everything else just look at it by itself forget what the director in, intended forget all the things around it now this brings me to that political question almost these days of can you separate art from the artist where it is often thought that if um, depending on the artist character you should just totally ignore their art suddenly your value judgments about their art have to be influenced by things that you find out about their personal life 
life so people will use this to for example dis picasso or uh, you know not watch polanski or woody allen's films and all of that so i'm curious about what you think about this because my stand to be very clear is that uh, my judgment of the art and my judgment of the character of the artist are two completely separate things i can love a work of art and i can absolutely condemn things that the artist might have done that they stand completely uh, separately even though at an emotional level for example i would never read something by say neruda once one knows about that early rape he committed and all of that you know and so on and so forth but there are many other cases which are not so clear cut in my mind like in any case i didn't like neruda's poetry and all of that but there are cases which are not so clear cut in my mind and my point there is that these judgments a judgment of the art always has to be independent for example if i was to give you a book right now and uh, it's is by an anonymous author say a new say even by elena ferrante are you going to suspend judgment on that work of art till you know everything about about the character of the artist that is not even possible so what is what is your sort of uh, take on this i'm i'm both glad and a, a little terrified that you asked this question because it's uh, you know it's one of one of those things that's so complicated that one 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 isn't sure you know one will be, be able to articulate all 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 of one's feelings about it you know forum like this first first of all let me just say uh, before i say something slightly controversial sounding uh, let me say that that i completely understand and empathize with anyone who depending on the things on the subjects that resonate most for them or the things that they feel most strongly about are so triggered by by what polanski probably did or what woody allen probably did or what vs naipaul or whoever probably probably did that they just cannot bring themselves to experience this person's films anymore i completely get that that is a personal decision it's 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 something that's completely valid uh, i might not be triggered by those things i might be triggered as, as somebody who's who's more involved with dogs than with most humans uh, homo sapien issues i i might get triggered by an artist a filmmaker or a, or a novelist someone who i discovered at some point has has engaged in severe cruelty to an animal if i if i hear of of a favorite filmmaker or a favorite novelist engaging in tremendous cruelty to an animal to a dog or something or something like that and that might completely put me off this person's books or films or whatever so the, all of us have different triggers and so i completely get that get that response even though many people just uh, and many people i know just make fun of that response you know the the, uh, the idea that you can be triggered enough by by what some someone has done to just to reject the whole body of work or to stop watching something or whatever because because logically also you know especially when it when it comes to to film as you implied as well in your uh, you know the in what you were saying uh, how does one even no one is ever going to have full knowledge about these things anyway right a film is a collaborative process you 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 might have apart from the director or the script writer you might have 20 other people who have played a very prominent role in the making of this film Or the, or the or the making of specific scenes within this film and there's a pretty good chance that one or more of those 20 people has done something ghastly at some point in their lives and got away with it or or whatever or not got away. so as new information keeps coming in how do you cancel things with hindsight how do you unwatch or unappreciate something that you've already appreciated you know it requires a certain sort of double think which I, which I, which i find very strange but when it comes to the broad question of the art and the artist one thought that i have which which i don't really feel, i feel like i haven't really seen it expressed in uh, most of the discourse that i've that i've uh, experienced about this what what happens is that many of the conversations that 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 begin with can you separate the art from the artist or from the person seem to imply that we just have one of two alternatives you know one alternative is no you can't once you know that the artist has done reprehensible things you reject the art as unsavory or unpalatable the other option is yes you can separate the two things accept the art as something that exists on it on its own terms and might have its own merits and continue to denounce the artist as an essentially bad person but the art as something that all just has a life of its own almost independently from the artist now for me these positions seem to carry the buried implication that when an artist who has done terrible things creates a book or a film or a song or whatever that is morally uplifting or empathetic you know or shows positive human values 
then it means that this artist was being hypocritical, concealing his real self from his audience. And I find that view quite problematic because, you know, because the way I see it is, if you were to ask, if you were to assume that, uh, that the allegations about Polanski, for instance, are completely true, child rape, whatever. And then with that knowledge, you then say, okay, can you separate Polanski, the person from his films? My answer to that, first of all, would be no, you cannot separate him from his films because his films are deeply personal works. You know, everything, even when he's adapting a work like Macbeth, he's putting so much of his own life experience into it. There, there are scenes in that which hark back to the Sharon Tate murder. And there is Polanski's personal life and his personality in almost all his work. It's all there. How do you separate the two things? Now, does that necessarily mean that, that we de- then just cancel all the films? And my answer to that would be no as well. Because for me, you know, somebody who's lived a life of 90 years or whatever, again, coming back to the we all contain multitudes thing, this is something that, that I know a lot of people will find this idea problematic. But, you know, if you have one side of your personality that has allowed you to do this really terrible thing, you might also have other sides of your personality that, that have allowed you to honestly create great art which, which has all these sensitive things going on in it. And, and why can't you just accept that, that, that maybe these, these two things represent different sides of, of the person's personality and then make your call. If you decide that, that the bad things he's done are deal breakers for you, then, then of course you must you know, n- never watch a Polanski film again. But I think the, the question of can you separate the art from the artist is inherently a reductive one in some ways. Because that, I don't think that question, you know, the, you know, whether you answer yes or no, I, th- I, th- I think there is a third possibility as well. It, uh, there is an in-between possibility. I think that question needs to answer itself because uh, just thinking aloud, I think what we're talking about here is not a separation of the art from the artist, but a separation of the judgment of the art from a judgment of the artist, where one can hold that your judgment of an artist can include that behavior, which is just horrendous. And you can think of him as a moral monster, but at the same time, your judgment of a particular work in which he may have put different aspects of his personality or his art or his craft or whatever, uh, you can still look at that work and say that it's uh, worth it. And I I agree with you that this is often personal. It depends on what your triggers are. For example, like I said, I can't read Neruda again. I I would not read anything by, say, Tarun Teshpal or an MJ Akbar. Uh, They're both writers of horrendous purple prose anyway. Uh, I don't know if there's a connection between purple prose and bad character. It is quite possible. But but for example, one one person I do feel conflicted about is someone like Louis C.K. Like before the Me Too allegations against him surfaced, he was essentially perhaps my favorite modern artist. Like the TV series he did, Louis, uh, not Lucky Louis, which was an earlier one and not so good, but a series he did called Louis, I think is an absolute masterpiece, which just gets better and better as it goes along through the seasons. And part of what makes his art great is the self-reflectiveness, where he is basically shitting on his earlier self all the time. It is like a person has just changed and changed and changed and he recognizes that he was once an asshole and his whole art is about sort of getting to you know, the crux of the human experience through just looking at all the mistakes that he has made. And of course, what he was accused of was absolute assholery and really bad behavior, but something that happened in the early 2000s. So you you don't know how much he had changed. The allegations at one level, uh, while they contained assholery, weren't really abrogating consent. He just misused his position of power, asked some women whether he could strip in front of them. They said, no, he didn't. It is still an extremely asshole thing to do, and I would not associate with someone like that. But do you want to invalidate his uh, later art? Do you want to say that people absolutely cannot change? So I'm a little conflicted uh, about this, you know, so my feelings about him have become very mixed. But my feelings about his art remain what they were because I can't be uh, expected to change my aesthetic judgment of something because of something else that I came to know later. So I guess at some level, we are making personal judgments about, you know, how much something triggers us or affects us. And by the way, you mentioned uh, animals, the film I mentioned, um, Cannibal Holocaust, one of the controversies around it was that six dogs were killed live during the film. While they were uh, killed, this very elegant, classical-ish music by Riz Ottolani was being 
played in the background so and i can totally understand why you would never watch that despite my praise of the film so it's it's kind of personal but at some level i think um, your one judgment of the art uh, should stand apart from the judgment of the artist but yeah very sort of muddy territory shall i go on to my next question or would you like to add to this no 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 i know I, I, i just wanted to add to that again you know that uh, based on what you said the one thing i just like to say again you know and this is where self analysis is, is such a you know difficult terrain you know you you, you you just you can just get caught up in it and you know it's obviously it's something that that all of us we, we, we all uh, uh, egotistical enough to want to do it but but it's so pointless at times because I, i really don't know while you were talking it struck me that i don't really feel that conflicted about my my, my favorite artists if i if, if i find out that they've done something really terrible something that i would disapprove of even to the degree of of committing crimes that that in a fairer world than the one that we live in they would be punished for and that that ideally they should have been in jail at a point when they were actually creating some of my favorite albums or films or books or whatever even with that knowledge i usually find it quite easy to to still enjoy the work i do i don't what I, i i feel like okay yeah yes injustice has been done or you know if, if it's not a you know not the sort of crime that that that, that is really punishable then as holery has been indulged in but it doesn't matter that much to me and and this applies even to personal heroes now now now, now take someone like bachchan uh, there are lots of things in his you know in, in his real world personality that i find incredibly irritating including the the, the things that he tweets the, the these things that i keep hearing i don't actually follow anyone on twitter but but but, but i keep hearing these things or seeing screenshots and 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 the, and the general sense or sense of this person who no longer has a personality of his own or whatever you know, he's he's just sort of you know, he's just you're just this anodyne thing none of that has made the slightest difference to the thrill that i still feel inside me if i if i happen to get on to youtube and i see a wonderfully performed song sequence like hai ke paan banaras wala aur jahan teri hai nazar hai or o saathi re from ukadar ka sikandar which is which is a favorite film i am just watching it and thinking oh you know, there on the screen is one of my personal heroes somebody who made my life better at various points in my life the same is true for sachin tendulkar his 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 innings you know came at a time in my life when they were you know among the Uh, you know the in 96 97 98 when they were among the few good things in my life and i find it perfectly easy to separate that from judgment of of the the annoying things or the quite dubious things that one hears about tendulkar in the current day for instance so i don't know maybe maybe i just sort of find that separation easier to to pull off you know the i mean maybe there's something about my reptile brain that just sort of does does that or does those things because i don't agonize a lot about these these questions somehow i i agree with you absolutely fair enough now sticking to the like some of this art versus artist separation obviously comes about because of the politics of our current times and some of it is great and but some of it worries me for example you have spoken in the past of quote and quote woke criticism and there is often a sense i get these days that all art is not just being evaluated through the prism of uh, that phrase which both of us have made fun of in the past how it speaks to the human condition but also through the prism of a certain kind of politics are the current are the correct values kind of being depicted here and the point is it's easy for us to look at something like a kabir singh and say that oh that is obviously they're glorifying a you know a, a certain kind of toxic masculinity and therefore we must condemn it and i agree with that it's it's a, it's, it's just horrendous but at the same time the point is in most art in most good literature in most good cinema you have characters who are conflicted characters who do bad things you know characters who are uh, uh, not woke i mean the whole point of art is that you're depicting humanity as it is humanity is imperfect humanity contains multitudes but, but when you sort of look at that art say you judge a film because of what its characters do it seems bizarre to me but i've seen that happen or you try to talk about what a film's politics is you know then it it becomes to use a favorite uh, phrase of many of these people it becomes problematic for me because i just want to look at art on its own terms i don't care about what agenda they there is or what agenda you can read into it where also a lot of overthinking can go on so uh, as a critic what do you feel about this 
Well, I feel many, many different things about this, and and, and how many hours do you have? <laughs> but but but, <laughs> but uh, oh, don't answer that. Uh, it's, uh, 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 first of it's all, it's basically unlimited, bro. <laughs> well, 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 uh, well, well, I could start controversially by saying that 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 I wouldn't even take. Uh, what you said about kabir singh as a given uh, a because i haven't watched the film myself so of course I, 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 I i'm not going to make up my mind about a film that i haven't watched and that that i've i don't really have i don't really plan to watch any time in the near future but i do know at least three or four people whose uh, judgment i respect a great deal whose prisms i respect a great deal one of whom is a woman which may or may not be important who did not feel that way about the film at all that the film is a glorification of toxic masculinity they they felt very differently and 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 these are these are liberal people i'm talking about broadly liberal people so 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 i'm not making those uh, those assumptions about any film uh, at all for having said that uh, i will express my view on kabir singh only after i've seen it not before that this is not an expression of of a particular judgment or a non judgment uh having said that uh, i also want to just just touch on uh, again you've articulated a lot of the issues you know the, quite neatly but uh, i'd also just touch on this thing of it's not just a matter of viewing art for for its own sake or in uh, it's not ju- no, ju- just a matter of that because because with that then of course you know you you also come to things like like the films of lenny riefenstahl and uh, um, I'm not going to say the birth of a nation, but but uh, but definitely Lenny Riefenstahl's uh, films, which were, you know, explicitly Nazi propaganda. And but but I mean, those are those are overtly political, and that politics is what it is. So it's it's fine to condemn those. But I'm I'm obviously not talking about those sort of edge cases. But no, no, what I what I meant was they're also uh, in parts at least they're 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 pretty good good films in terms of either the use of. the formal cinematic devices and techniques you know in in ways to to achieve a certain effect and many people still continue to to point that out while while also of course uh, holding forth on the problematic aspects but what happens is that that when a film is looked at only through the the prism of a of a very clearly defined ideology you know and and, and is looked at from this point of view that what is the film what is the politics of this film what is the politics of this filmmaker or script writer the thing is these are questions that that very often do not have clear cut answers uh, sometimes they do of course sometimes they do you know and uh, you know, uh, uh, there are cases of films that are made as explicitly as propaganda as you pointed out but with with a lot of art including art that seems self evidently to some people as as being go you know being as a as setting out to fulfill a particular agenda what is really happening is that a director or a novelist or a script writer is trying to build a world and in the building of that world what is happening is that moral judge, judgments moral or ideological positions are being suspended to a great degree and what they are trying to do is to be is to be as true as possible to the characters within this world now if those characters include people who who we liberals think are quote unquote problematic then you still will have a situation where a serious novelist or a serious director or a script writer if if they are trying to create this work honestly will be putting themselves in the mind space of this character will be forming certain degrees of empathy for this character's actions as well and that you know when 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 it is presented in the final film it can easily to seem to someone who someone who's looking at the film only through a very specific ideological lens it will seem like glorification whereas the truth might actually be a little more complex it might just be tied into the process of world building which is something that 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 that, that most serious creative people do and And, and when you are deep in, I mean, you've been a novelist yourself. You've, uh, and I know you've you've written other sorts of fiction as well. Uh, you, you know what this is about. You, uh, when you are dealing with this very difficult business of creating a world from the inside out and putting yourself in the heads of different sorts of characters, you are not necessarily thinking about moral positions or about what what the takeaway, what what the correct takeaway for your reader or your viewer should be, and. Uh, and i think a lot of these uh, wokeish uh, strictly ideological 
takes on films only want takeaways they only want a clear cut answer does this film endorse or does it only depict does it you know the, 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 what uh, what is the politics of this particular novelist in creating this character then but and and then and then those are subjective judgments anyway but then a lot of the people who make those judgments will behave as if they have the final moral word and anybody who you know feels differently is morally compromised or just not engaged enough or whatever it is and that's that's one of the most troubling aspects of uh, some of the political conversations around uh, cinema and literature these days for me i know speaking speaking as someone who's you know i'm on this podcast with you right now saying all these things in what will be a public forum soon even so i know that that i feel very constrained if i if i find myself in the presence of someone who is just going on and on about how regressive a particular film is oh this character is so problematic this this film is so regressive i'll sometimes feel like it's it's not worth my while to argue i'll just keep quiet and and and, and you know and maybe just try and change the subject or something and that's a pretty because 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 that is definitely affecting discourse and 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 i know there are many people like me who feel that way who feel that that uh, that, uh, that a lot of the left liberal slash woke criticism cultural criticism has just become all about very narrow ideological prisms or 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 narrow ideological definitions rather than looking at the entirety of what a film or a book might be doing the many contradictions that exist within a particular creative work um, uh, one of your earlier guests on uh, seen and unseen uh, parumita vora has spoken very eloquently about this in the context of a lot of uh, hindi films that get sweepingly described as regress- regressive or problematic or toxic and she has defended them in her writings and in in some of her talks as well about how so many of these works are actually far more complex than than many people realize there are there are there are different things going on in them you know you you might have one scene or one line of dialogue that that seems really terrible and patriarchal and whatever but there'll be something else there'll be there'll be there'll be another impulse in the same scene that will also be working against that or providing a cushion against that and that's how a lot of popular cinema tends to work i don't know if any of this has made sense but no it makes a lot of sense i mean just a couple of episodes ago i had kavita krishnan the feminist on the uh, show i mean i'm why am i even saying a feminist we are all feminists i i would hope uh, i certainly am one but uh, one of the things kavita spoke about was how people look at enid blyton today where they are trying to almost uh, in hindsight cancel enid blyton and her point was look i read enid blyton i loved enid blyton and the characters i identified most with and the characters that enid blyton in fact uh, made stand out were the people who were bucking the system the tomboys for example among the girls at Mallory Towers you know so you got to look a little deeper than the, the the fact is that society is regressive people are complex and it's a job of art to capture all of this and not necessarily to pass judgment otherwise you become facile propaganda now my thinking is and and tell me what you think about this is that there are really two impulses or two two sort of phenomena that kind of lead to this phenomena one is that on the one hand it might seem that in the age of social media all of history is available to us you know unlike you and me we don't have to scramble to watch movies from the past as we used to do in in the 1980s in your case going to embassy video libraries borrowing now it's all on the click of a, a button legally or otherwise but actually that's not totally accurate view in the sense that yes it is all out there but i think as jonathan hate pointed out in an episode of a podcast i produced brave new uh, world uh, which is hosted by wasandar he spoke to jonathan hate and if i remember correctly hate it was hate only who pointed out that uh, uh, what most people consume on social media is what has been produced in the last 3 days so it's very current is bound to the current time they're not really going too far back into the past now in your case your education of cinema like even when you said that you don't watch too many films today the bottom line is you have put in a lot of time w- watching films and watching films of the past all of it informs the way you look at uh, cinema and that's true of every good film critic including you know someone like bharatwaj rangan comes to mind who was also you know such a star during the uh, blogging days and a fantastic critic so uh, you know you have this bedrock of historical exposure which informs whatever you do but everyone today uh, is kind of stuck in the current moment where everything you're consuming was maybe produced in the last 3 days and all of that and this can sometimes garble your perspective and you you almost in a sense become trapped in the 
present now this brings me to the second factor and this is true especially if you're on social media where you're even more trapped in the present because everything is of the moment where in social media what is the imperative for a lot of the people out there especially the young people is to raise their status within whatever in groups they have chosen within social media and I'm, the vast silent majority haven't really made such choices and uh, luckily i think you know you spoke about uh, these things that you're saying on my podcast in a public forum but i would imagine that podcast listeners who have gotten this far are not the kind of people who outrage on uh, social media anyway so you and i are safe but, uh, but but social media people form their echo chambers and they need to raise their status within those echo chambers they need to posture their purity in different ways they can do it by attacking people on the other side and always attacking people never engaging with arguments they can do it by attacking people on their own side for not being pure enough which eventually happens to everybody in fact most of the people the wokes cancel or seem to be former wokes uh, in a sense in current times so you know they're going to come for you eventually unless you produce absolutely nothing and only outrage in which case you're safe and and therefore these two come together that on the one hand you don't really have a deep uh, understanding of whatever it is you're critiquing whether it's literature or cinema or whatever and on the other hand you need to posture all the time and this is easy meat right you shit on a film uh, you say that oh it is regressive this character is problematic this director uh, tweeted this when he was 16 years old and it's it, there's absolutely no cost to this kind of posturing to you but it has such a harmful effect on the discourse because these people may be a, a vocal minority but the, because they are the vocal ones uh, the majority of the discourse seems to be like this so you know do you kind of agree with this are there things that you would add to this and if this is broadly what the picture is then do we have hope moving forward uh, i don't know well as as a as a part time nihilist i always say there's no hope moving forward but uh, <laughs> uh, this uh, no and i agree with pretty much everything you know you know amit i the i don't like using the term virtue signaling because i i think it's i think it's a very easy term to use i am very tempted to do it and I, and i do end up doing it especially in private conversations but, but one reason i don't like using it is because of something that that you touched on that which is that when for instance and i'm not really on twitter but but on facebook as sometimes and i go through these phases where i where i, where I see a lot of feeds and things very often i i see uh, uh the term virtue signaling being used in a deprecatory way by people who i myself at some point in the past have thought of as virtue signalers yeah and then i wonder maybe people are thinking that way about me as well in other contexts so you know so so it just becomes one of those loops and you know and and it's and even a term like you know the wokester used pejoratively which is something i like doing and i, and I like doing it in a slightly sort of the cheesy way you know the uh, using the word they're using the star wars terms wookies or ewoks or whatever uh, it's it's <laughs> it's, it's, it's fun to do that but but I, a part of me does feel a bit uncertain and uneasy when when i do it because i know that there are probably contexts in which people can feel they can say the same thing about me as well uh, based on things that i've definitely things i've written in the past and uh, possibly even now broadly agree with everything you're saying uh, it does disturb me though you know and, and now uh, just to again perhaps come back a little bit to to what we were talking about a bit earlier uh, i was on a conversation once with you know just just uh, doing this online uh lecture for somebody and there were these these very engaged young people talking about films and asking for recommendations of old films and and it was it was great fun and then uh, subsequently one of them started following me on instagram and i happened to uh, go and see uh, the instagram page and i saw this write up about the philadelphia story the 1940 film the philadelphia story which is with with the catherine hepburn and cary grant and james stewart one of my favorite films from that era and uh, the language used for this film what it was so patronizing and condescending words like nauseating misogynistic you know stuff like that uh, just based on uh, what happens to the to, to the main female character Tracy Lord over the course of the story the fact that she sort of that she that you know in this this uh, this young writer's interpretation uh, she's just sort of being manipulated by all the men in her life and eventually just driven to the right man etc etc and i was just looking at that and thinking you know the, the philadelphia story of all films is being described as nauseous and misogynistic these are strong words you know it's it's incumbent on us to use language with a little more care 
because ultimately what's going to happen is we you know you, you, uh, words like misogynistic or islamophobia or islamophobic or whatever these should be strong condemnatory words but what's happening in a lot of the current discourse is they are being used in such casual and careless ways that they'll end up losing their potency to start with for someone like me they've already lost their potency i see the word misogynistic some written somewhere my first impulse is to think there's just some some wokester overreacting to something that's my first response rightly or wrongly and i find this uh, again to use that word problematic the word that we we supposedly dislike but at the same time i do have a lot of sympathy for for young people who are living in this time of so much clutter so much stuff that's available to them all the time even someone like me you know if i if i uh, uh, at my age if i get a recommendation for a for a limited series like like uh, mayor of east town or whatever which is just seven seven episodes or something and i and i get you know the motivated enough to watch it because of the recommendations and because i like kate winslet or or or, or i like the genre or something i'm still taking seven hours of my time out and at the end of it i'm thinking wow you know even if it was good I, I, i've just spent so much of my time doing this this is, this is despite the fact that i'm also aware that there are older things that i need to watch or rewatch for columns or for some of my own writing and i need to find the time for that i can, i can only sympathize with with young people who are in this world where where they are binge watching maybe four or five or six series every month and watching films and and so on uh, it's completely understandable that they will end up lacking a sense of history i don't really think there are going to be any easy solutions to this i have i have been in classes like like i indicated just now i've been in classes where 20 21 year olds with utmost sincerity have asked me how do we find the time to watch all these old films that we want to watch and by old films they they mostly mean films that were not made in this millennium <laughs> films made before 2000 so it's like, i mean there are uh, there's a whole generation of movie buffs right now who think that that anything pre christopher nolan is is ancient but they don't have the time to do this and and, and i do have basic sympathy for that because all of us have finite time we we, we are just being inundated with so much information so many things to watch across all the ott platforms across all the other spaces uh, even i feel that pressure so i can imagine what it's like for for younger people so so no uh, easy solutions to this i mean you know the only thing i could uh, the only piece of advice i could give anyone was to you know if you have 7 days a week to watch you know to spend 4 or 5 hours per day watching things just try and and create a schedule for yourself tell yourself that that two days a week you will watch something that was made pre 1970 for instance you know something that that comes out of a movie recommendation or a criterion re- recommendation or whatever and even that won't be enough because then you know you they'll end up watching american films or french films they might not engage with with old hindi cinema which is which is something that's that's very difficult for young people to engage with now because 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 everybody is grown away from that tradition of the song and dance and the masala it's it's very difficult to start start magically tuning your mind to that sort of thing so 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 no easy answers at all there's no hope there's no hope basically yeah i kind of uh, yeah i mean do i kind of agree i guess i kind of agree but i mean we are all going to die anyway so if you look at the really long long term of course there's no hope uh, but hope for what the fact that sometimes i have to remind myself that look i am in my 40s and most of these young people have a different frame of reference entirely like i think um, uh, i saw this tweet recently i think akar patel did it who's tweeting recently is incredibly entertaining and uh, akar was referring to some piece of news somewhere and he said oh bloody you know basically oh bloody but he's uh, spelt it oh bloody so below that someone commented oh blada and below that someone commented life goes on and i'm like only someone of my generation actually gets this in fact the moment i saw the reply oh blada i was tempted to type life goes on till i saw someone's already done it reference of course to the famous beat little song please uh, please tell me you tweeted bra no no i didn't tweet bra <laughs> that's something you got to remind yourself that these people have a very different frame of reference that uh, you know that they may not have uh, sort of heard or watched or read all of this stuff from the past 
and uh, but what has now happened is and i don't think that this sort of a lot of the shallow expressions from people who haven't engaged with cinema but will nevertheless pass judgment on it on the basis of the politics i don't think that worries me uh, in one particular context which is i don't think less people are serious about cinema if anything i think there are more serious film watchers now than ever before because you have the means to engage deeply with um, uh, cinema and all of that so i don't think that that is necessarily an issue but what is necessarily an issue is that a lot of the shallow posturing is just dominating the discourse out there so to uh, a, a newcomer who would earlier 15 years ago perhaps have discovered a movie through reading something that you wrote on your blog will now not want to watch the movie because somebody else has called it uh, toxic or misogynistic or whatever and that pollution of the discourse in general worries me but you know moving aside from this sort of political angle which is what it is one of the good things that has definitely happened is in terms of form like it strikes me that in the same way that you and i we were talking about how in our writing we were liberated by blogging because that form remove many of these constraints that we otherwise have and it strikes me that there has been a sort of a revolution of form within uh, the audio visual medium in the last two or three decades as well which you know for me most significantly when hbo brought out the wire that for me is a turning point and uh, obviously there were great shows before it i mean kislovsky made decalog for polish television so uh, that is of course a pinnacle of oh, <laughs> a series like this but for me what was so incredibly exciting about the wire is uh, in particular that that show is that it allowed its creators to take on an almost novelistic sweep like before that i would think of each film as a sort of a, if i had to compare it to literature i would say it's really a short story of sorts it's one kind of narrative you have two hours three hours is a limit to how deep you can go that's what it is what the wire really did was it didn't have one main character it had a whole bunch of characters with tremendous depth it had that sweep it had that range and what we now have because of the ott revolution that you know netflix kind of kick started um, or really got going with house of cards in, in the subsequent decade is that you have this form so in formal terms your audio visual storytelling can now really expand and go places so number 1 do you think this is significant because i don't know what the term cinema even means so i'm using the general catch all term audio visual storytelling but it just seems to me that this has way more scope today than it ever did in the same way as uh, for example printed books would have enabled longer forms of literature which might not otherwise have been the case so on the one hand there is this but on the other hand you also have the means of production becoming much much cheaper which is why you have people on youtube and tiktok expressing themselves doing brave new things like i don't know if you watch the blog the vlogs of kc nystat who is a youtube creator who is doing very cinematic things at one point he would post a vlog a day and they would all be basically short films of him doing interesting things but made in a very cinematic way creating a language of his own very influential similarly in tiktok uh, you know which uh, like the, the a lot of the stuff that becomes popular is just voice crack based stuff or funny stuff or memetic stuff but there was also a lot of other uh, deeper stuff that was going on there which was absolutely mind blowing and it's hopefully still going on in the rest of the world though sadly india uh, banned it so the two separate questions one do you see that this expansion of form as something that has led to a golden age of cinema which i believe we are in there's a lot of crap around but i believe that uh, you know and could be the selection bias based on what i get to see now as opposed to what i got to see say 20 years earlier but uh, you know would you broadly agree with that and then do you see is there a sense of excitement also about these new forms of film making that is being enabled by technology no uh, again i agree with with pretty much everything you've said even though i've i haven't experienced uh, a lot of this stuff you know that uh, tiktok for some for instance is something that i haven't experienced i, I know about your uh, uh, regard for 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 a lot of what has been done there and and also i uh, i find myself just just uh, in principle i find myself quite irritated by by some of the snobbery that was aimed at tiktok especially when it was done by by, by people who who had this means of expressing their creativity if they had had certain forms of creativity and and a lot of people from you know from uh, from another class who were sort of looking down on it and just being very condescending and saying some appallingly uh, classist things about it so that's so why in principle i agree with that completely despite not having uh, really experienced as much tiktok as you have 
uh likewise for the for these shows uh, you know i haven't seen the wire i haven't seen so many of these iconic shows i haven't even watched breaking bad for instance there there's so many shows that you know you'd be astonished to 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 learn that i haven't watched and and i don't think i'm going to end up doing it because my mind just recoils at the idea of taking out 30 40 hours for something like this i, I don't know if i'll be able to do it now but but again in principle and also based on my limited engagement with these things because there are some series that i've watched including a few of the indian series which which i had been asked to specifically review which i keep getting told are not as good or as polished as the, as the best uh, international series but but i liked a lot of stuff about stuff in them uh, and i have great respect for the format uh, so uh, you know for, for the way in which uh, in the hands of a good showrunner a good script writer it's possible to just create this long narrative arc to just sort of plan it out you know right from the start and to to have this trajectory where where something that has been done in episode 1 or episode 2 makes complete sense only you know perhaps in season 2 or season 3 you know it's been it's been planned out that well beforehand and that's something that's that that, uh, that you can only admire you know i i i often find myself wishing that that alan moore had been 30 or 40 years younger because i think he would have been a fabulous showrunner for for uh, you know and i'm not just saying this because because there's actually been a series of watchmen but uh, I, i just think about you know the what what someone like alan moore a younger version of alan moore could have done with something like from hell or watchmen or something you know you know just just creating this absolutely brilliant series because because he did that so much in his actual writing and in the in the in the directions that he gave as artists uh, for panel creation uh, back in the 80s and 90s uh so so, so i'm a base so yeah so in principle i'm i'm a big fan of this sort of thing uh, i was a late convert to it because uh, there was a time i think maybe 7 8 9 years ago when when people were raving about about how uh, there's this golden age of television and how so much of what, what we have on television is brilliantly cinematic it's as it's better than most of what you see in in cinema halls at that point i i i, I said really i mean it's uh, how is it going to be cinematic it'll probably just be pictures of people talking right it'll be because, because i still had that stereotyped idea of what what a tv show look like say back in the 70s or 80s you know i'm talking about international shows so of course i was pleasantly surprised by what i did end up watching eventually and and i, and I, and I completely uh, get that this is a very exciting time i do tend to be slightly resistant to the to talk of golden ages uh, partly because of the the recency biases and things that we have partly because because i'm i'm so old in my head that that i, that I find it very difficult to think of anything other than 1940s hollywood as as the golden age of cinema <laughs> or or even or even the 1920s when when the silent film was heading towards its great apotheosis and then was unfortunately destroyed by the coming of sound uh, so so i am i am that vintage but, but but again in principle yes i i have no trouble with 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 anyone referring to the current moment as an as a golden age in terms of web series tv in particular OTT. Yeah, I mean, so now now I've come to know that you know, given that you live in that era, the Philadelphia story for you must be something made by young whippersnappers. But it's 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 so fascinating that we can kind of inhabit not just different characters but different eras in this way and immerse ourselves in different worlds. I mean, that's the beauty of cinema, literature, art, all of that. Now, so we've already chatted for around three hours and we haven't even spoken about books. I wanted to speak to you about writing and your writing process. We haven't even gotten there, and I wanted to chat with you about. Hindi cinema and Rishikesh Mukherjee as well, which we will save for a future episode. So I will extract that promise from you now that we'll talk again. But before we end uh, this particular episode, normally I kind of end my episodes by asking my uh, guests to recommend books that they love. But in in your case, it's going to be both books and films that you know. And I don't want a best of list. That's uh, an insane expectation. But just um, you know, off the top of your head, five books or films that you feel you would like to share. with the world five books five films my god <laughs> i was oddly enough i wasn't prepared for this moment in the podcast even though it's it's, it's such an obvious one 
all three of each or whatever comes to mind i i don't want it to be like a formal thing ki are ye age how about 300 of each <laughs> done done are no 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 that, i'll take the easy way out by recommending one rishikesh mukherjee film that that no one seems to have heard of including possibly uh, rishida himself but, but but it really is it is honestly one of my absolute favorites i i feel very defensively about it because it's is the sort of film that that that, that just uh, you know even, even those who do discover it unfortunately it's available only in a very ordinary print online on youtube uh, it it hasn't been restored or anything it's a 1965 film called bb or makan and and amit in fact i actually think this might be a film that that might be might even be worth your while to watch uh, uh, or, to, or to or to at least try and watch some of because i think i think you will at the very least agree with me that it's that is a very interesting hindi film for its time for for what it does with the musical form uh, it was produced by hemant kumar who was who was this uh, of course the great music director and it was Gul, gulzar saab's first collaboration as a lyricist with rishikesh mukherjee and it's it's this film that that bas- that's basically almost operatic in terms of how it you know it tells this this fairly lowbrow comedy story of of friends who are forced into a cross dressing shenanigan because they uh, because they can't get accommodation so the, so two of them have to pretend to be wives of the other two but it it just uses musical sequences so interestingly as you know as part of the narrative as things that that take the narrative forward uh, sequences that actually require the actors to be really acting performing it requires a certain degree of orchestration in terms of how the the movements are done and so on it's it, it, it's an example of uh, is definitely a counterpoint uh, to the idea that many people have that that a lot of hindi cinema just used musical sequences as a standalone which which was completely divorced from the main narrative so so it's, it's a film that i have a lot of love for it's it's also uh, the rishikesh mukherjee comedy that that's a direct precursor to the later well known comedies like golmaal and chupke chupke other films uh, Uh, well, the psych- psycho, of course, I've, I've already spoken about. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to get into all that. I'm not going to say Jane bhi do yaro either because that's 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 just too obvious. And because I've, I'm probably fed up of the film by now. I don't think I could watch it again after having watched it those dozens of times for the for the book that I did on it. But uh, there are a lot, a lots of uh, Noah Noah films of the 1940s. Again, coming back to 1940s Hollywood that I have a lot of time for and a lot of love for. one of them of course is uh, the the billy wilder film called uh, an ace in the hole also known as the big carnival which 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 seems like a you know by extremely resistant as i am to to things like relevance or topicality it it feels like a very relevant film for the current day as well it's 70 years old and it has kirk douglas as this this reporter who tries to exploit a very tragic situation involving a man who's been trapped in a cave and it it feels like something that's that's very pertinent to to the media carnivals of the current day as well and of course there was a hindi film from a few years ago called peeply live which which also explored similar terrain a media carnival built around a, an inherently tragic and personal situation well those are three books i grew up with a tremendous love for inner blightens far away tree series i think a lot of uh, the the trio of books that that made up the, the these stories about about this uh, the little brother and sister who move to the countryside and then you know find themselves uh, being taken to all these magical lands at the top of a magical tree deep in the woods it's also one of those books that f- first opened my eyes to the possibilities of of how writing can literally take you to to uncharted places or to new and new lands or to or to places that otherwise can exist only in your in your fantasies as someone who's a huge uh, uh, who's who's been a huge uh, mahabharat fan for the longest time one book that i love is uh, shivaji savant's mrityunjay which was uh, written in marathi it's been translated in in english by p lal and uh, nandini nopani uh, i've read the english version and i've also read a great deal of the hindi version the hindi translation is is, is the only book that i've read a lot of in the only novel that i've read a lot of in hindi and it also ties in a little bit with with some of the stuff you were talking about earlier because 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 this is a book that's centered around the character of karn 
who uh, was one of my personal heroes growing up, uh, one of those tragic figures, those anti-hero figures that, uh, that, that I felt a tremendous affinity to, perhaps as a melancholy child myself. And what I love about what uh, Shivaji Savan did with this book is, is how he, uh, again, tying in with some of the things we were talking about earlier about the, the problematic behavior of people and so on, how he puts us in the mind space of a very conflicted and tormented character at precisely the point when that character is doing some morally very questionable things. So, for instance, you know, the, uh, during the humiliation of Draupadi in the, in the Swayamvar, the, after the dice came, Karan's part in that, in that process, there's this brilliant 20-page passage in this book, which, which, which counts among the finest bits of literature I've read anywhere, where in Karan's voice, in his first-person voice, Shivaji Savan just gives us this man who goes from a, a, a point where he actually wants to be the savior, he wants to be the, the, the chivalrous hero to this woman who's in distress. He goes from there over, you know, a series of things that happen, you know, his, 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 the way his mind is working in this very fevered way, the way he's responding to the things that are happening around him. He goes from there to actually saying some of the cruelest and most savage things to her in her moment of distress. And, and the way that's done is just an eye-opener for what literature can achieve in terms of putting us in the mind space of a problematic character or somebody who's doing something problematic and, and, and making us empathize. And, and perhaps seeing that we too are capable of such behavior you know, in, in the right context or the wrong context or whatever it is. Uh, I love that book for that reason. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Kazuo Ishiguro's confounding novel, The Unconsoled, which uh, is his longest book. Which you've described memorably as a book that spends 500 pages going from point A to point A. Did I do that? Where? That's oh, your okay. description. Hey, that, that's yeah, a, one of your old pieces. See, you don't even know what you've written. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty good description. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of it's myself. Yours. I should start plagiarizing <laughs> myself now at some point. But uh, no, so so again, that's that's uh, among Ishiguro's first five or six novels. This was easily the least read, I think, and the one that uh, that uh, I think it was possibly the only one of the of his first six books that wasn't uh, wasn't shortlisted for the Booker Prize. I'm not sure if I got that right, but uh, it, it was definitely a book that confounded a lot of people for very good reason. But uh, uh, but, but I loved it because it was one of my first uh, you know introductions in literature to to the truly surrealistic narrative, to what, to what surrealism means on the page in terms of creating this world that, that is both seemingly real and completely exaggerated at the same time. You know, directions mean nothing, where geography means nothing, time means nothing, everything is stretched out. I had encountered the uh, equivalents for these things in the films of uh, Buñuel, for instance, or, or or in the or in some of the paintings that I knew of uh, Salvador Dali, the persistence of time, the persistence of persistence of time, right? With the, with the melting clocks. I think so. But yeah, about, yeah, uh, yeah. but I think this this may have been the first time that I, that I really experienced its equivalent in in a novel, and I was blown away by it. All the more so because I I opened that book with no idea of of what it was going to be like. I just thought it would be a regular narrative story. And then, then I found myself having to figure the book out in the process of reading it and figure out what this writer is trying to do. And it was a fascinating experience. That's a three of each. Yeah, three of each. Uh, you're done. And in fact, when you know, when I read The Unconsoled, I it gave me so much joy and delight. And I'm really glad I didn't have to write about the book because then I would have had to work so hard trying to articulate why it gave me that joy and delight. Because you're right, it's just a, a confounded book that way. And you mentioned Bunuel's, um, uh, you know, some of his surrealistic work. And I especially am a big fan of the last three films he made in the 70s, all of which were co-written with Jean-Claude Carrier, yeah, who yeah. I think died a few months ago. You know, The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, which is about a bunch of people who are sitting down to a meal but they never actually eat anything it's just they keep sitting down and the meal never happens then in 74 he made the phantom of liberty which is again a delightful and confounding film where you know he'll start with uh, the camera on a set of characters in a scene 
and uh, you know one of them seems to be the main guy but then it'll follow some random person he meets and do another scene with that guy and so on and it's all disconnected it's not even connected segments it's all kind of disconnected like you know passing the ball kind of thing and then finally in 77 he made that obscure object of desire which included two actresses playing the same woman with thus uh, you know adding to her mystique and all of that so i those three films of bunuel which were made when he was in his 70s if i remember correctly uh, not just in the 1970s were um, no so no so so, 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 the, so the phantom of liberty is a great favorite of mine as well and jean claude carrier actually i spoke with jean claude carrier about it many wow. years or many even around 15 years ago or something and he he told me that the, that the, that the 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 idea for that film just came from a little conversation he and bunuel were having where they were saying let's why don't we do something like why don't we do something that that completely defies the laws of narrative so you know so you have this let's imagine this scene where where two uh, where a husband and a wife are arguing ferociously about something and we we, we don't know exactly what they are arguing about but but we know that that their argument pivots on the contents of a letter that is shortly to be delivered to their house we 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 figure this out from their conversation and we and they are, they they are fighting fighting in this very abstract way and they 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 their tears and recriminations and then there's a knock on the door and they uh, one of them opens the door and the postman is standing there with the letter hands the letter over to them they start to open the letter the camera follows the postman out the door and and uh, and uh, you know they and and they to see what what he's up to next and uh, it's uh, yeah it's it's a lovely film i uh, that so so yeah so so the unconsoled you, as you can imagine was also made me feel the same you know somewhat similar to to watching some of those bunuel films yeah so i mean you know i think lots of uh, uh, dope people you know all the films and books and everything that we mentioned we'll i'll link it from the show notes jay thank you so much this has been a pleasurable conversation i hope we can meet again in person and just chill and have coffee and go to bookshops but i think that is going to take a while but in the meantime you must promise to come back again and we'll talk more about hindi cinema and rishikesh mukherjee do we have a date Yeah, no, no. Uh, thanks a lot for calling me. This has been great uh, to do this, uh, you know, and, and to do this over three or four hours or whatever it's been. That said, we definitely need to do at least one follow up to this, possibly two, possibly ten. <laughs> <laughs> Man after my own heart. <laughs> Let's especially, do this. Especially yeah. if this pandemic continues for another decade. So, so we'll. Uh, so, so yeah, th- uh, thanks so much. And and yes, uh, on a more serious note, that coffee should happen at some point too. Please come to Delhi. whenever it's safe to come here and thanks rishikesh mukherjee lots of other things to discuss as well yeah yeah thanks a lot we'll discuss all of that as for when when is it safe to go to delhi dude i don't even feel like it's safe to go from andheri to bandra right now but i have to get moving at some point so hopefully we meet again and uh, till then adios if you enjoyed listening to this episode check out all the links in the show notes enter rabbit holes at will You can follow Jay on Twitter at Jay Arjun. You can follow me at Amit Verma A M I T V A R M A. You can browse past episodes of The Seen and the Unseen at seenunseen. dot i n. Thank you for listening. Did you enjoy this episode of The Seen and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to seenunseen. dot i n slash support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you.